Good afternoon and welcome to what I consider to be the greatest racetrack in the world for what is going to be a showcase event. It is one of the finest moments in the British GT calendar and this is the 16th time that we have shown up here and we are ready to entertain. I'll tell you what, one of the things that is always incredible about this magnificent circuit is the sheer unpredictable nature of the weather. So never mind the cars and the drivers and everyone else that's going to appear here very shortly. You just have to look up and it's never clear. Even though it's sunny right now, there are clouds over there. Yesterday we saw some torrential rain that invaded at qualifying and threw all sorts of things into the mix for the, uh, for the AM drivers that were out there. And there's just, because there's a microclimate here in the middle of the Arden Forest, you really don't know which way it's going to go. Even though it might look super bright and your app is telling you, yeah, sunshine for certain. Sometimes that rain just throws us into the mix. And I'll tell you what, it makes for absolutely compelling racing. It's one of the reasons why this is the coolest place in the world as a racetrack. And on top of that, of course, you've got Eau Rouge and all the glory that this track beholds. I speak to all the drivers all the time, and whenever I say, where is the best place to race, almost all of them say, it's here. I wonder if Joe Osborne agrees with me. He is part of our superstar commentary team of Andy McEwen and Joe Osborne. Thank you very much, Andy. Well, let's go straight to Joe Osborne then. I think I know the answer to this question already, but what do you think of Spa? Yeah, without uh, beating the drum that everyone says it's the best track in the world, bar <laughs> none. And uh, yeah, every time British GT has come here, there's always been a great race as well, which uh, I think is nature of the circuit, leads to good racing and makes it more entertaining to watch. And as you know, Andy, giving you a lift yesterday in the hire car, I got to give you my own version of Spa on the uh, on the motorways as you were white knuckle riding next to me. But uh, yeah, no, we can't wait to get two hours around here with 40 cars on the grid. It doesn't get any better than that. And the sun shines out, so rain will be around the corner. Yes, Andy J, I must stress that was. I'm nowhere near brave enough to get into the passenger seat alongside Joe Osborne, having uh, worked with him. <laughs> I get a picture of uh, what I'd be in for. Uh, yes, we're very much looking forward to this one then. Uh, two hours of racing, 120 minutes, uh, as is the case now for all of these remaining races in the season. Season, really we're done with our sprint races that took place at the start of the season at Alton Park and Setter and then we have the three hour extravaganza at Silverstone and then four two hour races Donington Park, Spa, Brands Hatch and back to Donington again again for the uh, season decider uh, and it looks increasingly as though these championships are going to go down to the wire both in GT3 and in GT4. In GT3, I remind you, it is the 72 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini of Adam Ballon and Phil Keane that leads the way. They're on 104 points. Second place in the championship, their teammates, number 69 Barwell Motorsport Lamborghini of Johnny Cocker and Sam Dehan. They're on 95 and a half points. So that, by my very rough mathematics, is eight and a half points between them. Uh, with Johnny Adam and Graham Davidson, the four men at the moment, they won last time at Donington Park on 72 and a half points. So they're a little way back, but a win or a, even a podium here if the Lamborghinis struggle could be enough to bring them right into play. In GT4, it's even closer though, because whilst in GT3 it has been rather Lamborghini dominated in the early part of the season at least, in GT4 it has been anybody's guess, quite frankly, from race to race. The Multimatic Motorsport Ford Mustang squad have done well, and Scott Maxwell and Sebastian Prio's number 15 car has won twice this year, including the most recent race at Donington Park. However, they only arrive here less than 10 points clear of Dean McDonald and Callum Poynton in the HHC Motorsport McLaren, and then it's the Tolman Motorsport McLaren of Jordan Collard and Lewis Proctor, uh, that of the two Tolman cars has been enjoying most of the good fortune this year. Uh, they were winners earlier on this season at Snetterton as well, and they are third in the points with Calvin Fletcher and Martin Plowman, fourth overall in GT4, leading the Pro-Am rankings. So the cars then are making their way down onto the grid, and a busy old grid it is, a sunny grid at the moment as well, for the time being, but as Andy J said, you can see up in the sky there, definitely some slightly threatening clouds. And uh, the number eight machine there that's rolling onto the sixth grid position will be started by Richard Neary with Adam Christodoulou taking the wheel afterwards. Pole position after qualifying yesterday, a wet qualifying session yesterday, went to the number 96 Optimum Motorsport Aston Martin of Ollie Wilkinson and Bradley Ellis and their combined qualifying time because qualifying is split into two sessions, an AM and a PRO session, and they add the fastest AM lap to the fastest PRO lap, and their combined time was 1.8 seconds quicker than anybody else. It's the uh, WPI Motorsport car that stars second on the grid. That will be started by Mike Ligo, but Dennis Lind will take over after the pit stops, and he is down with Andy Jay. 
Yes, I'm happy to say I'm here with Dennis Lynn. Now, Dennis, yesterday you were so quick. I think when you took the car in Quali, you were around about 11th, and here we are. You managed to get them into P2. How, why were you so fast? What was your secret? Yeah, well, well, we're in a good car. We have been a good car. The team has done a great job putting the car together for us. We know the Lambos really quickly in in the rain. We had a, a good race in Monza also with it in, in the rain. So we know the car is quick. Uh, we know it's cap what it's capable of. So, uh, so yeah, here we are. I mean, you've really set a market down, haven't you? Now all the other teams are going to go. Hang on, he's starting P2. If he has a decent first turn, he's going to be hard to catch. Yeah, I think we're going to. We're in a really good position. Uh, I think the two silvers who are behind and in front of Michael will probably get past him and probably do some distance on him. But if he can stay in that position, then it's really good for the team. It's going to be very exciting to watch. Thank you, Dennis. Enjoy Thank yourself. You. Appreciate it. Um, guys, should we? I think I can see Bradley Ellis as well. Um, I, I saw Bradley Ellis and he's wandered off. You know, the challenge with this uh, little five, ten minute pre-cars arrival is that the drivers come out and then they kind of walk around. But I'm pleased to say I, I have spotted him. So let's let's grab him because there's a really nice fact. Hey, Bradley. Hi, How you doing? We're live. I would uh, request that you don't swear. I know you're not a big swearer, so we're all good. Um, now, Bradley, I've got a big question for you because this is quite an important moment for you. Your last British GT poll, can you remember when it was? It was 11 it, years yeah, ago. It was like <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, 11 a years ago. ago. Now, the good news is, the last time you were on pole in British GT, you went on to win the race. Yeah, I'm hoping it's the same result again today. So, no, I mean, Ollie did an amazing job yesterday in the wet. Um, I mean, it's the first time I've driven the car properly in the wet as well. So, now I think, you know, the team did a great job to give us a car that was drivable. Um, such a short time because the rain obviously came 10 15 minutes before the start of quality so a bit of a panic but yeah the team did a great job and we enjoyed driving it so it was good fun i tried to make it clear to our fantastic viewers that the rain is one of the most unpredictable things about spa isn't it yeah so don't you don't even need to look at a weather app because you never know what's what's coming just look at the sky and then you get what's going to happen in the next 10 minutes that's about it have you got any tactics have you have you sort of had a bit of a discussion about what's going to happen in this race yeah i've told ollie just uh, give me a huge lead and then i can just try and hold on <laughs> he'll have never heard that before <laughs> no. appreciate you talking to us cool. have a thank good thank race very much. thank you um i think i should probably run down to gt4 don't you are you guys all right to just uh, have a bit of a chat because again it's quite a way i suppose we could do that for you andy yeah that is what we're here to do after all we were just uh, having a look at some of the work being done to the optimum car actually looks like maybe something to do with the exhaust manifold the expert alongside me tells me uh, to me it's all just very expensive bits of aston martin but that aston martin was quick yesterday in both sessions as you'd expect i suppose it is a, a silver driver lineup so they have to carry an extra 30 kilos of success ballast as well in gt4 it's slightly less success ballast just 20 kilos but they have to spend a bit longer in the pit lane than their pro am counterparts Let's talk about GT4 then, because it was a fascinating GT3 qualifying session, but the GT4 session was even more topsy-turvy, wasn't it? The number 42 Century Motorsport squad, a car that could do with a good result, really, Jacob Matheson and Mark Kimber, qualified on pole position, and in the AM session, Mark Kimber was about three or four seconds quicker than anybody else. The reason for that being they judged the tyre situation perfectly, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. And like we say, when the rain comes in, it also goes away. So it's easy to bolt wets on because you know it's raining. It's harder to know when to put slicks back on. The track doesn't dry evenly. Uh, if it's in the sunlight, if it's getting the wind more, even altitude makes quite a big difference here at Spa. And the Century guys called it bang on and they were the only car in their session to gamble on slicks. And that did lead to a 3.4 second uh, margin over everyone else. The second session was clearly more dry, so everyone went to slicks, but even then it was only the last kind of laps that made sense for those slick runners. So it's so difficult as a driver and an engineer, there's always a good argument. The engineer tends to be a bit more cautious. They're a bit more academic normally than a driver, so they'll look at the facts and the figures, whereas the driver are, tend to look at the straight, try and look at the last corner and get a bit of a build up a picture uh, of what to do. So that's why we've seen a real topsy-turvy GT4 grid there. Well, speaking of Mark Kimber then, who put in that brilliant performance yesterday, I believe that Andy J has made his way down to the BMW and is there to talk to him. I'm down in pole position in GT4. I promise you I'd get here, but it is. It's quite a hike. It's fabulous here. I've got Mark Kimber with me. Now, Mark, you guys obviously on pole by some margin, and I believe that's because you made a quite a maverick call with staying on slicks in the wet. Yeah, Jacob made the right call in the first qualifying session, choosing to go out on slicks, because the track here dries really quick due to the nature of the circuit, so it ended up being a bit of a gamble, but it paid out in the end. So it's quite. I mean, it was quite some turnout, wasn't it? About three and a half seconds 
wins over everyone else. Yeah, at the start of the session we were a little bit behind on times and then as the track dried out, I think he went around about four seconds, quickest by four seconds, so yeah, so it gave us quite a margin. Let's talk about pressure. How are you How are you feeling going into this race? Uh, I'm pretty confident. The, the car felt good in warm-up, so made a few changes and it, it's looking quite good for the race. If we can manage the tyres, and then I think we've got a good chance. BMW's around Spa, pretty special relationship, isn't it? Yeah, I've never been to the track before, so I haven't done many laps around here before this. Well, well, tell me what it was like the first time you went up Eau Rouge, then. Yeah, it's, it's pretty scary at first, but you've got to build up to it, so, yeah. But the Did you have a moment where you're just like, I'm going up Eau Rouge in a race car? <laughs> a little bit, yeah, but, yeah, it's quite special to drive this track, so, yeah, really excited for the race as well. Brilliant. Enjoy yourself. I'll let you get in the zone. Have a good one. Um, guys, if I've got time, I'm going to try and get a bit further back and see if I can I really want to try and bring Andy Prio to you because of course he's guesting here taking on, well he's got a car with Sir Chris Hoy, they're sharing a car and it was a father-son situation because of course Andy is taking on Seb even though they're sort of teammates and Andy just edged it in quality, like only just so I want to try and grab them if I can but again it's a hike so you might have to find me Right okay well it is a good story that though isn't it because Andy Prio is, is uh, on the same grid as his son now in the same team but in different cars and Andy is actually sharing with one Sir Chris Hoy now between the two of them they've got some 14 world titles two MBEs and a knighthood uh, so they really should know what they're doing and they're both handy drivers as well uh, Chris Hoy's done quite a lot of catering racing races a historic mini quite often as well and they're in the number 19 car together then Andy Prio and Sir Chris Hoy and it will be Chris that takes the start of the race the sister car has qualified a bit further up the order um, and that will be uh, Seb Prio and um Scott Maxwell, <laughs> who will be uh, sharing that car. And because they're silver drivers, they can alternate who takes the start. So we'll find out momentarily. I think usually Seb does the second stint, and um, it's uh, Scott who does the uh, the first part of the race. The grid is being cleared now, so I don't know how much uh, Prio chat we'll be able to bring you. But we'll let you know if we can. Wow. Uh, we should be able to find out in the middle of the race. Now, that's something you don't see every day, Joe, isn't it? Possibly for the best. Yeah, that's a, that's a strong look. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we've seen F1 get rid of grid girls this year, quite rightly, I think, as well. And, uh, yeah, that's a full circle, isn't it? That's going uh, all the way. It looks like they'd probably already paid for their uh, grid girl outfit and the grid girl's transformed into a grid boy. And it, and it fits wonderfully, I must say. So uh, there we go. That's <laughs> some nice inclusivity then on the uh, uh, pit. And that was on the grid, excuse me, that was the Ram Racing car, which starts, uh, by the way, uh, from fourth on the grid with Ian Loggy at the wheel, the car that uh, won that dramatic race at uh, Silverstone earlier this year. There is Sir Chris Hoy who is a uh, multiple Olympic cycling champion and uh, has raced in British GT before, of course. A few years ago, he was at the wheel of the RJN uh, Nissan GTR in the GT3 category. And again, was pretty handy. He was one of the top AM drivers back in the day. They were rather hampered, I think, by the, the tricky conditions in qualifying. Well, I think Andy might just have made it down that far down the grid. Andy, where are you? Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sort of beyond the back of the grid now. We've, we managed to catch Andy just as he was dashing back to the team. Um, now, Andy, I said in a little bit of a waffle that it's, there's a little bit of father-son rivalry going on, and currently you're just nudging it. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. It's nice. Sebi's, um, you know, a driver at the beginning of his career. I'm a driver that's, they say, present and almost past, um, but still still really feisty. And um, yesterday, I, he, he wouldn't want me to give him anything, and, you know, <laughs> I, I gave as much I could to help him and, and develop him but he's never been to spa before and he's running the car 20 kilos heavier because I'm a pro-am and um, he equaled my time pretty much with the weight and everything so he's doing a great job and the Multimatic guys are just awesome with him and giving him an amazing chance to go uh, and to race in British GT which is a superb championship. You managed to answer that like both a racer and a dad. <laughs> it's not an easy one because um, I don't want to go home getting you know totally beaten by my son um, but at the same time you know I, I know that Seb spent a lot of time in this car and he's super quick and I didn't expect me to just be up the road he, he is really driving well and uh, but you know I'm competitive and um, yeah I've been a factory driver for 21 years so he wouldn't want me to give him anything you know he's a racer and he's competitive and uh, you know we're just doing our best and letting the natural process take take its own process and we'll see who, who's there at the end but he's uh, he's in a great position on the grid uh, he set a strong lap he's p3 he's leading the British GT championship with Scott Maxwell 
so uh, it's all focused on them now. This makes me feel quite a bit better about not letting my eldest score every goal past me in the garden. Now let's talk about your car, because this is a special car, isn't it? Probably the most decorated car in terms of your combined honours that we've ever had, sharing with Sir Chris Hoy. Yeah, I mean, uh, what, a, what an absolute legend uh, Sir Chris is, and really super nice guy, very professional. Uh, it's a great honour for me to drive with him. Uh, he's scored a few more world titles than me, but we've both got a few. So um, it's a lovely, uh, lovely opportunity. And, you know, obviously the guys at Multimatic, Larry and everybody put it together and, and they, they're, they're just, it's lovely to get that chance, you know, to race at Spa with your son in a great car, the Ford Mustang and with a, the legend, Sir Chris Hoy. A lovely family weekend. Thank you for yeah. talking to us. Have an excellent race. All right, Enjoy guys, yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, guys, I'm sure you've got more important things to do now than to listen to me. So uh, race on, huh? Uh, well, indeed so, and already drama, or near drama anyway, for the championship leaders there who stalled on the grid, but as we saw, thankfully, they did get going. Here is the grid then, and it is Aston Martin from Lamborghini on the front row. Ollie Wilkinson will start the Optima Motorsport car. Alongside him will be Michael Igo. Ryan Ratcliffe in the other silver entry is third in the Bentley with Ian Lockie's Mercedes fourth, and then another Mercedes, uh, sorry, then the Adam Ballon car will be fifth, alongside the other Mercedes of Team Aber Racing's Richard Neary. Then Sam DeHaan, second in the championship then, uh, just behind the sister car on the grid with Rick Parfit keen for a good result in the 31 Bentley. Then Dominic Paul in the Century Motorsport BMW, Graham Davidson in the number 47 TF Sport car winner last time, ahead of Sean Balfe in the McLaren and Mark Farmer in the second TF Sport Aston Martin. Tony Quinn and the M2 competition squad are making their debut this weekend. He's got Darren Turner alongside him, Seamus Jennings alongside him on the grid, then JM Littman before Jacob Matthiason, who is the lead um, GT4 car for Century Motorsport. Patrick Kibble is second in class with Scott Max Maxwell, the championship leader, the car that he shares with uh, Seb Prio, third on the grid. James Dorlin desperately in need of a good result. He lines up fourth with Calvin Fletcher, rounding out the top five, and again, the quickest AM driver in qualifying. Then it's Ash Hand for TF Sport, Jordan Collard in the better of the two Tolma Motorsport cars in the championship, but lower down the grid than the sister car. Mark Murphitt and Alex Top jones just outside the top 10 in the GT4 grid. Patrick Matisse's Optima Motorsport, Aston Martin, has Callum Poynton's HHC McLaren alongside. Then you've got Nick Jones and Richard Williams sharing the 14th row of the grid. Jack Butel and Steve McCulley in the Invictus Games Racing Jaguar that sprung a few good Pro-Am results so far this year. He lines up 30th overall, ahead of Eric Behrens in the Alphab Racing McLaren, again, making its first appearance. Sam Smelt's race performance for the Mustang is next, ahead of Graham Johnson and Andrew Gordon Colbrook in the second of the century BMWs, not enjoying the same fortunes, really, as the sister car. Then it's Mika Stanley and Sir Chris Hoy, car number 19, starting 36th on the grid, uh, some way down the order, 21st in GT4, Ruben Del Sartre, and Mia Fluitt, 38, with Brent Millage next up uh, in the car he shares with Dino Zamparelli, the Porsche Cayman, and at the back of the grid, the pair of McEwans, unfortunately. Alex and Ross will be coming from 25th and last in GT4. So, this is it then, the seventh round of the championship, the business end of the 2019 season now, well and truly, with lots of nice juicy points on offer in this two-hour encounter result of this race could prove to be pivotal in deciding who lifts the championship trophy in both GT3 and GT4. It's also mathematically possible for Barwell to wrap up the team's championship in GT3 if both of their cars are in the top few positions, but we'll get to the uh, points permutations a little bit later on. So Ollie Wilkinson then will start the Aston Martin from pole position. Michael Igo, who we've seen getting involved in some brilliant uh, races earlier on this year at Silverstone in particular, he put in a real star turn, making some brilliant double overtakes. He only has to overtake one car, though, from where he starts, but that car is being driven by one of the two silver-graded drivers, both of whom are right next to him on the grid, because you've also got Ryan Ratcliffe third, with Ian Loggy fourth. Two hours of racing here at the Spa-Francorchamps circuit in Belgium. Gets off to a very messy start. They're going to surely abort the start, are they? The red lights are still on. No, no, they do go out very late, but that's a really congested start, and they're going to be even more bunched together into last source than they normally would be. Here comes Ian Loggy into second position. GT4 cars are on the grass. Everyone holding their breath in the hope they all get through. So far, so good for GT3. GT4 have kept themselves together as well, miraculously, but that was a very clumsy start, and out of it all, it is still going to be Optimum that lead the way. Ram Racing second, then it's the Bentley Continental from Team, from, uh, team Park Racing in third, whilst Michael I goes down to fourth, ahead of the championship leader, Adam Ballon, in fifth position on the grid. The GT4 category make their way through as well. Oh, that's not a place you want to be from the curb making contact. One of the HHC cars trying to make progress. 
Whew, that was close, and I thought for a horrifying moment it was all going to end in tears. Ryan Ratcliffe and Ian Loggy. Now, we've seen this somewhere before, haven't we? Remember back to Alton Park at the start of the season when these two made contact a lap and a half into the first race of the season. Speaking of contact, that's Sam DeHaan that goes round. Contact from Rick Parfit, and the car that's second place in the points is pointing the wrong oh. way, facing the oncoming GT4 traffic, who I think have all seen him. And that was a half-stopping moment, but this is the second race in the last three that one of the Barwell cars has been pointing the wrong way on the first lap it is almost like they're trying to lose this championship isn't it now that wasn't intentional of course but look plays such a big factor in motor racing and that was really a bit of bad luck they could not afford yeah awful luck i didn't see what the contact was obviously rick was on the inside as we see the mustang versus the aston and gt4 mustang's not really an overtaking place and to pull on not big enough brake spot but yeah it looked like sam dehan was happy with his position and rick was happy with his and they didn't really see each other and they collide and yeah, as you said, the championship now, the momentum is swinging away from Barwell as we get a replay. So we're trying to look behind, and it Ooh. just looks like Rick's hit the apex curve, which has unsettled his car and forced him to run a foot or two wider. And uh, unfortunately, that's where Sam Deham was occupying the space. And I think Sam Deham was fully innocent there, in my opinion. Um, he's got a lot of work to do. The good thing is he's got an hour and 57 minutes to do it. Um, that's one of the messiest starts I've ever seen from British GT. It looked like the GT3 girl, as we see Sean Balfe trying to go around the outside there. Uh, right, fairly big car lap BMW, so I'm not sure if he's uh, even seen him as we see uh, Davidson get down the inside of Igo. And uh, I think what we're seeing here is a wet qualifying, which obviously everyone's got their strengths and weaknesses driver and car wise, but now it's dry, everyone's in the wrong order potentially. So that's why we're seeing so much action so early on. Uh, but everyone did a good job from that um, initial messy start where the lights and I thought we we're going to go for a delayed start. We did go and everyone kept out of the wall as we see two battles going into the source hairpin, trying to get the cut back, get the exit, and off we go. So this is Ballon uh, all the way through. Yeah, it's definitely not Sean Balfe. No. I can see that's uh, we're on board with the 72 Lamborghini, and it is the Team Abba racing car uh, of Richard Neary he's trying to overtake. Driver of the day so far, though, has to be Graham Davidson, who's got himself into fourth position from 10th on the grid to highlight your point of how uh, jumbled up the order is at the moment. And, uh, yeah, the number 47 TF Sport Aston Martin on real charge. You mentioned that he just got past Mike Ligo's WPI car. Here comes Sean Balfe on the inside of two cars Three into late cars. Oh, that was close, and it's still not over yet oh. because that's the other Barbell car that nearly is on the receiving end of a punt from the McLaren. That was never really on, but an ambitious move to make. Uh, thankfully, though, Sean backed out of it before it actually did develop into anything that he couldn't get himself out of. Yeah, it was almost a bit reminiscent of the uh, F1 move Hacken and Schumacher at the end of the Kemmel Strait. Uh, luckily, uh, no contact on either of those, but looks like Sean's got a, a pretty quick car underneath him and actually looks like he's probably happy to stay there. And near it at the moment, looks like he's the cork in the bottle uh, with a few cars stacked up. So his car might start to improve as the fuel load comes off, as we see him on the kerb turning in. It's always going to unsettle it. And uh, I think Ballon feels like he's out of position as well. So uh, we can already see the leaders in the distance getting away. So if you're looking to try and get a podium out of this race, then Ballon, Balf, Parfit all need to try and get past Neary as soon as they can. Yeah, they already at the end of the previous lap. Ballon was 7.2 seconds off the race lead. That's growing by the corner, though. And as you said, Richard Neary, not only is he not as quick as Ballon, but he's also defending, which further holds everybody up. A bit of a gap now, though, as they head through the bottom part of the circuit. Wilkinson pulling a gap at the front of the field from Loggy second, then Ratcliffe third, but Graham Davidson is the man on a mission here, and he's catching those two cars in front of him, so a three-way fight for second is about to develop, I think. And then this battle going on between Mercedes, Lamborghini, McLaren, Bentley, and then BMW, all getting themselves closer together as well as they head through Blanchemont on board again with Sean Ball, who is in ninth, uh, well, eighth position, in fact, at the moment, because he's got past uh, Dominic Paul's BMW on this lap. Nearly got another two places at the end of the Kemmel Strait last time around. Here again, not on the ideal line through the bus stop, and this is Ballon's opportunity maybe to get alongside, but Adam has to be careful here, doesn't he? Because the slightest misstep here from any of these drivers could spell disaster for his championship hopes. Yeah, exactly that, and he's the only guy in this group that's got a championship hope, um, and all the other drivers will know that, and their co-drivers will be reminding them as we see that Merck's got great traction, considering it's front engine versus a mid-engine car, which the mid-engine car should accelerate better. Looks like that Merck's just got a little bit more. Let's watch him through a rouge. We'll see which car's a bit more confident carrying the speed. Looks pretty equal. And then cutting the top. We are running to FIA track limits here, even though it's a British series. So as long as you've got one wheel, uh, it sounds str strange to have one, not two, but one wheel, as we see Ballon uh, probably getting done by Balfe if we 
shoot to the exterior, see if uh, he's done it all the way around and drag path it all the way through. So as we we're talking, he's got a championship to consider and from going to get past Neri at the front, he's now fourth in line to get past Neri. So it's, uh, yeah, all change. And of course, Graham Davidson saying the perfect thing here, isn't he? By applying pressure to Barwell, he's got storming up the road and is challenging already for a podium. And the Barwell car is slipping down the order. So this momentum shift that we've been talking about from Barwell to TF Sport, it does seem to be continuing rather, at least in the first six and a half minutes of this two hour encounter. There's a long way to go, but time lost now in such a competitive series as this is not going to be easy for them to regain later on. Yeah, exactly. And I think Parf is also a slight dark horse here. Uh, yesterday had his third pole position in three years at GT3. So he's got a lot of pace as well as we see Neary drop two places already on this lap, so it's starting to unfold into a slightly different battle now. Yeah, and then you've also got Dominic Paul and Mark Farmer joining in now. Mark Farmer there in the blue Aston Martin, but a bit wide at the exit, just about, I think, within the rules. That won't really have helped his exit speed particularly. But this is all getting rather close now in the early stages. Right, let's drag our eyes away from GT3 for a moment and focus on GT4, where this man, James Dorman, is leading the way by nearly three seconds at the moment over second place man Ash Hand in the Aston Martin there, who's got his TF Sport teammate Patrick Kibble, the youngest driver on the grid, right behind him. And then the other Tolman car, Jordan Collard in fourth, with Scott Maxwell, who was fourth at the start of that, now down to fifth position. So Aston Martin and McLaren seeming fairly evenly matched here. Now, Patrick Kibble flashing his lights here at his teammate. There can be nothing more infuriating if you're Ash Hand than seeing that in your mirrors. But if Kibble feels he's quicker, when do the team step in and say, well, let him go and see if he can chase the leader? Very difficult. Uh, at this level, both silver, silver drivers, so these guys are trying to make a profession out of this. The team can advise, but both of them are in their right to do what they want. It's, it's not Formula One. These guys aren't getting paid. They all need to prove their worth to try and become professional later on in, in the GT3 kind of category. Um, and it looks like they're pretty even over that first half of the lap that we watched. Uh, obviously, Dorlin's got the jump, as we see, which is good. And it looks like from uh, from Collard's infuriating headlight flashing uh, that he thinks he's quicker than the two Astons as well. We see how much time Sam DeHaan's lost. He's not even leading GT4 yet. So having to let all those GT4s go past him, then turn around and get going, you can understand how much time lost that is. And, being brutal already. If he wants a result, they need a safety car at some point over the next hour and 51 minutes to close everyone back up and allow him to get rid of some of that time deficit. Yeah, uh, Sam Dehan is 46 seconds off the GT3 race lead, just to put this into uh, some perspective. This is not the GT3 lead, but it is second place, and it's Ian Loggy still in second. Ryan Ratcliffe and Graham Davidson right with him. And there is the optimum car leading the way of uh, Ollie Wilkinson then. There, Michael Igo running in sixth position. Sean Balfe should come through next in seventh. There he is, and then Rick Parfit going with him. So these two seem fairly equal on pace at the moment. There's the number eight car, the Team Abba Racing Machine of Richard Neary. I believe we're going to see a replay here of how he lost this ground. Oh, Puon is not a place you want the rear of the car to be behaving badly, but that seemed to be the case there, didn't it? Yeah, that was a big old moment. He turned in all right, and then the car just loaded up and sent out as we go to the uh, dash foot cam of Sean Balfe. So it'll be interesting to see if he left foot or right foot brakes. It's a great camera to have live. We sometimes use this in driver coaching to see if there's any problems with fit and position. And you can see how long he's been full <laughs> throttle, how quick Spa is. Something like 60%. There's a little lift as he goes into Blanchon, back to full. And then we'll see a big break into the bus stop. Where it's probably going to go down five gears. Right foot braking, going down the gears. You can see no heel and toe needed. Paddle shift does it all for you now. Well, that's a great, great shot to see what the driver's doing there and how much of Spa is full throttle. Yeah, uh, well, exactly. To see who's taking the grey pills through Blanchard to no Rouge as well, because there was, as you said, that little comfort lift there, wasn't it? Just to make sure the car was settled. Now, Adam Ballon seems to have found a bit of fire in his belly again now. He's starting to attack Richard Neary here. This is the battle that's going on for ninth position overall, I believe. And this is the fight they were having two or three laps ago, but for about fifth position, and now they've lost those places. And still, Ballon can't find a way through. So the Team Abba Racing Mercedes holding on for now. And they do seem to have different strengths and weaknesses. Through a ruse there, the Lamborghini may be able to carry a bit more corner speed, but then what's the straight line speed like? Remember, Ballon has a slipstream as well here and isn't really taking chunks out of the Mercedes, is it? Still, Richard Neary feels the need to defend the inside line, though, and this is going to back Ballon up into 
Graham Davidson's teammate, Mark Farmer, who goes around the outside. And wow. that was a lovely move by Mark Farmer, who's taken his criticism this year. But that was a really nice move. And again, an important one, thinking about the championship battle. Mark Farmer is out of it now, championship-wise, but his teammate needs this 72 car to fall as many places down the order as possible. Yeah, exactly. And I think we've seen the strength of the Aston Martin there. It's not even in the slipstream, and it's driven past balance. So maybe the Lamborghini's hurting a little bit top speed, but... Mark's done it perfectly, he got it stopped, and then again, Ballon's worrying about a championship, he can't try and outbreak Farmer and risk any contact, so he's just had to back out of it. And I think Ballon probably needs to regroup now. It looks like he's just been shotgun approach trying to attack Neary. He needs to pick one spot, every lap, pick that spot and find his weakness. We've seen a mistake at Puon from Neary, so maybe coming out of a no name, he needs to show his nose going into Puon and try and replicate that mistake, because at the moment, this is really, really hurting him as we see all stations the same in GT4. These guys are, are following each other so closely. Not quite as much downforce as GT3, so it doesn't hurt your lap time quite as much and you're able to do that. But we see, unfortunately for Bunny, he's still got Lippmann behind him as well, so he's not even clear behind and can fully concentrate on looking forward. He might be better to try and stay with Farmer uh, and use Farmer to be the guy to open the door on Neary and follow him through, as we kind of saw Parfit do with, uh, with Balf on Neary. And, See him using all the road and a bit more on the way in there to launch one just to open the corner up and take away some of those angles so you can try and make it flat through there without having to lift. Back to GT4 then, second place this is in GT4. And it does look as though the 97 car of Ash Hand is starting to hold up Patrick Kibble a bit and now Patrick is really feeling the heat from Jordan Collard and Scott Maxwell behind and they are rather allowing James Dawley to pull away. James is over three seconds up the road from them now. This uh, Mark Farmer, Aston Martin, continues to go on the attack now, trying to find a way past Richard Neary. And uh, again, the Mercedes does get off that corner bar. Now, it looks to me, again, from an untrained vantage point, that there's a lot of weight over the back of that Mercedes. Does that help, do you think, that initial traction and grip off the tight corners? Because it does seem to really good off that hairpin, doesn't it? Yeah, I think as well, it's just got so much torque and great pun, by the way, by Vantage Point on board with the Vantage. But we see now the top speed of the Vantage. And I think he's just going to be able to cruise past him. I think Neary's defenceless unless he goes really late on the brakes, which, which he, he does, does. It proves me wrong nicely, and keeps that position. And you can see he's run wide. He's now going to slow everyone up again. And this gap for uh, Ballon is going to be absolutely killing him inside. He's worried about the championship for not crashing, but if you don't have enough points to win the championship, it doesn't really matter. He's not there. Adam Ballon is not there because J.M. Lippmann is. But yes. where has the Lamborghini gone to? It came across. Into the pit. Yes, it's it didn't come across up. the line. It must be in the pit lane. So what has happened? We need to try and find out where that number 72 Lamborghini has gone whilst we were riding on board then. We did see it have a problem on the starting grid. It was yeah. slow to pull away. It looked like it was a turn it off and turn it on and it's OK, but it seems strange that it had a problem pulling away from the grid and it's boxed so early. Uh, there's no way that strategy, obviously, no one can pit before 60 minutes. So that's an extra stop. So, yeah, I think us talking about his championship has really, really cursed it for him, unfortunately. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting if we can see uh, in the pit lane what, what the problem is if the Barwell guys are working on the car or it's, it was gone out straight away. You couldn't script it, could you, for Barwell? This, uh, and everything that can go wrong in the second half of the season seems to go wrong. This is the car, remember, that won both races at Snetterton. It was the first time in a long time that the same car had won two races in the same day. Uh, and they were, they were never out of the top four, in fact, in the first four races. Ah, we're hearing it was a 10 second stop go penalty for the 72 car because the mechanics were working on the car after they should have left the grid, which we they had to because the car wasn't going to move if they didn't. I suppose a 10 second penalty was better than a non-star, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, with three minutes to go, uh, no one can work on the cars. We see Balth and Igo going battle to battle. Balth's got great pace to catch Igo up at, at that rate. And I think he's got uh, down the inside of him. And this is really the battle of the brave intro rouge so Igo's got the first inside but I'd rather be Balf on this instance and have the main inside for the right hander oh. as they still say side by side and Balf was on the inside and then Igo managed to carry the speed they were almost a bit too polite as we see Parfit benefit from all of that and could go from third oh. to first in this battle um, very clean racing by both of them, but actually I think they were both a bit too polite. It was after you, no, after you, please. <laughs> but I suppose that the, the, if there's a corner where you don't want to mess around, it's Eau Rouge, isn't it? Oh, Balf again up the inside, but couldn't quite uh, make that one work. But yeah, the, the last thing you want to do is make contact at that particular part of the circuit, because not only is it a dauntingly quick corner, 
but part of what makes it so daunting is there isn't much runoff area really, not like Blanchimont at the end of the lap where there is a bit of room to go if you get it wrong. And O Rouge, you're straight into a tyre wall, pretty much head on, and still Sean Bolf, having now lost a position of course to Rick Parfit, as they both have, has not been able to find a way past the WPI Lamborghini, which is now the uh, highest running Lamborghini in the race. And we've seen that a few times actually uh, recently, the uh, WPI car running really strongly. Uh, so that now puts them Parfit into fourth, uh, sorry, no, into uh, sixth position by my reckoning then is that because for some reason our timing screen is refusing to acknowledge the existence of the Optima Motorsport car, which I assure you is still leading the race with Ian Longy second, Ryan Ratcliffe third and Graham Davidson fourth. And then, yeah, Parfit into fifth place now with Argo sixth and Sean Balf in seventh position. GT4, it's still dawdling from hand, and that gap is still around three seconds, so you're not missing too much in GT4 at the moment. Uh, but we'll look at them anyway, because they're still very close together, and those TF Sport cars rather do attract your attention, don't they? And this is about the best we've seen out of TF Sport, really, in GT4. They had a torrid start to the season in both of their categories. The highest placed of the TF cars is the 97, the Ash Hand and Tom Canning car. They're fifth in the championship on 57.5 points, so that's about 30-ish points, 33 points, I think, off the championship leaders. So they're not completely out of it yet, but they really could do with a podium here and therefore the support of their teammate, maybe, to help that uh, to come uh, to fruition. And Sean Bolf then. Where is the McLaren stronger than the Lamborghini? Do we think that he had a better exit there from the bus stop chicane, but there's no room on the inside at La Source. If you were in Sean Balfe's... Uh, well, never mind, because he's got... I'll right do that right one. <laughs> ...right around the outside of Mike Ligo. I suppose that is always a valid option, isn't it? Surprise the driver in front with a move they're not expecting. Yeah, um, uh, Igo's had to do the right thing, cover the inside, but Sean's got the confidence and the speed just to go all the way around the outside there. So, although he's had to go a, a, a greater distance, uh, meterage-wise, he's obviously been able to carry the speed all the way around that radius of Eau Rouge and carry it through. As we see the Balfe guys go crazy for that move, it's... Uh, Nice to see how much they support that from their uh, <laughs> team owner and uh, am driver. It is a bit warm out there. They're probably conserving their energy for the important matter of the pit stop in about 40 minutes or so. Here's a replay of some uh, Graham and Mark Farmer activity as he tries to go around the outside of Richard Neary, who is not going to stop for the corner. Oh. oh, and Mark Farmer, who couldn't buy some good luck this year, no matter how much money he had. And unfortunately, well, what's your take on this one, Joe? From the front, look racing instant-wise, I think Mark's got the confidence to go around the outside as he as he did to Ballon early in the race. From there, it does look like Neary's running deep. It didn't really leave Farmer anywhere else to go. Um, if we could see a little bit more from uh, Neary's point of view as we see a McLaren door up. Is that the unique McLaren air conditioning unit at work there? Yeah, that's uh, the side DRS system <laughs> that uh, we've been working back at, at base. Um, luckily, it looks like the air pressure will force it back down. So I actually don't know what the uh, race director will do with that in terms of a mechanical failure flag. If it builds up enough speed to latch itself as we see it box, uh, and that's the Academy car that they're actually swapped from the Aston Martin, which had a big crash in the European GT4 race in Zandvoort, and they've uh, jumped into the McLaren for the weekend. So they're going to have to hopefully just slam that close, and the, the catch might have just been a jar as they left the grid, potentially, I guess. There is damage to the front left corner as well, which I don't think is related to that, but uh, it's had a, a hard opening stint to this race then, has that car, which is uh, not our first early unscheduled pick visitor. The GT4 second-placed battle then makes its way down the hill. James Dorlin, though, is being caught by this group, despite the fact they're fighting each other. They were a few tenths quicker than the race leader on the previous lap, being spurred on, of course, by the um, the uh, chasing Tolman car in fourth position, sort of trying to push these TF Sport cars along. Scott Maxwell not quite able to go with them. And uh, my timing screen is working now. Thank you very much for whoever suggested a, 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 a way of sorting that out because Ollie Wilkinson now does exist, and I can tell you he's 1.1 seconds clear of uh, Ian Loggett at the head of the field. Yeah, that was it. Endurance and GT.co.uk on Twitter. Uh, British GT have had the marvellous idea of anyone that's got a question while they're watching the coverage can tweet into me at Osborne Joe with anything you want um, so uh, yeah any questions fire away we'll try and answer them as, as best we can we've already had one from James Atkinson saying should we have a longer race at a longer track um, so not a bad track to do it at I think 
We'll see at the end of two hours if uh, anyone <laughs> fancies they could have done a bit longer. I think normally two hours, I'm a little bit tired and ready for bed. Well, likewise. But if you do fancy the idea of a long distance race at Spa, they can cater for that next week because it is the Spa 24 hours next week, which many of these drivers will be in, uh, competing in. Interesting fact about, first, uh, about Spa 24 hours, actually. The first one, 1921, when the circuit first opened, only had one car entered, so they cancelled the race. Oh, really? Next week, we have 71 cars on the grid. <laughs> so that shows you the strength of uh, modern GT racing at the moment. Well, and the GT3 category, bear in mind they are all GT3 cars as well, which is remarkable and uh, what a spectacle that will be. The GT4 cars provide us with plenty of entertainment as well, thankfully. And that's one thing I do love about the British GT Championship is the mix of classes. I sometimes get frustrated at the mix of classes and having to deal with that market, but it does provide some very lively racing. Yeah, and we're seeing uh, Jordan Collard here in fourth actually drive very mature, which I'm surprised at for him. I know Jordan well out the car, but he's doing exactly everything right here. Those two Astons are kind of messing up their, their own performance, I think, at the moment. As we see him trying to have a look, as we see actually that second one has dropped back a little bit now. So Jordan needs to save everything up and try and get past them and split them. Um, he's, he's done 20 minutes behind him now, so he should know where his strengths are. Uh, versus the Aston Martin and see where you can get them. Uh, the interesting thing in GT4 is they're a bit more road car based. So actually this circuit here at Spa, because so much it's full throttle, some of them struggle to make the fuel as we see Jordan go all the way around. That's how good I am at coaching. <laughs> Little word in his ear and he's done it within two corners. So Jordan's now potentially maybe got slightly better conditioned tyres because he's been parked up behind that Aston, not pushing 100%. He might be able to now reel in Ash Hand and then even James Dorn and his teammates. So this uh, battle over the next 30 minutes or so is really going to interest and uh, I think it's going to flow well. McLaren have a good history here at the Spa round of the British GT Championship. In fact, it was a McLaren that won the first ever British T GT race at Spa uh, back in 1998 when Tim Sugden and Steve O'Rourke's McLaren F1 GT1 was victorious. And those were the days, eh? The grid now a little larger, but those cars were very spectacular and uh, used to go well here at Spa, so it turned out. Bentley's tend to go quite well here as well, and indeed uh, Rick Parford is setting some good lap times at the moment then, but is in 10th position now, according to... Oh, he's just been in the pit lane, I believe, probably for a penalty. Let's see what race control are telling us. This uh, will... There's no notification of a penalty, but we did see him have that contact, didn't we, with Sam Dehan at the start of the race, so I reckon he's been in to serve a penalty. Drop down into 10th uh, into position. So the order then is Ollie Wilkinson leading, number 96, number 16, Log is second. Ah, oh, 43 is in the pit lane, unfortunately, though. That's the sister car to the car that started on pole position, Andrew Gordon Colbrook in. It's had contact there, Joe. What might that have damaged? I suppose there's any number of things that could break in the uh, front corner. Yeah, with the boys under the car like that, it's most probably a steering arm. So uh, what controls from the steering wheel to the steering rack to the wheel, essentially, uh, could be bent. Uh, normally that, that's on the lower part of the wishbone, so yeah, it's not a quick change on any car, uh, especially in a two-hour sprint race, that's going to be impossible to get near that time back, as we see the sister car, which was on pole position, uh, which is uh, obviously very quick in those mixed conditions, but maybe not so much in these dry conditions. We see Kelvin Fletcher and the Beach Dean Astin really harrying him. I mean, Kelvin Fletcher's performances this year as an amateur driver have just been absolutely amazing, so... Uh, from silver screen to bronze driver, he's uh, had a good uh, a good transition there, and he's he's loving his racing more importantly. That someone who's not doing it full time can come into a level like British GT and and be so competitive. Yeah, he used to be an actor that did a bit of racing, and now he's a, a racing driver that does a bit of acting on the side, and he's become a very, very handy pedaler, one of the quickest AM drivers in GT4, and in a GT4 field that's made up predominantly of silver entries as well. So he's regularly up against drivers that in theory, should be quicker than him, but that doesn't often seem to be the case. And indeed, the BMW in front of him, number 52, being driven by uh, Jacob Matias at the moment, he is a silver-graded driver, and Kelvin looks the quicker of the two at the moment. Now, they're in different cars, of course they are, but Kelvin, nonetheless, really impressing here. He's leading the Pro-Am Championship in GT4 as well, uh, is uh, Kelvin Fletcher with Martin Plough and his teammates. And uh, Kelvin is everything you want, really, out of an AM driver, isn't he? He's quick, yes but he rarely makes mistakes. He rarely brings the car in bent and damaged. He hands over in a decent position then for Martin to finish the job in the second stint. Yeah, definitely. He's actually a really, really nice guy as well. As uh, My first meeting was actually shouting at him when he blocked me in a qualifying lap a few years ago, and he couldn't have been any more apologetic. <laughs> and actually, we've been relatively good friends since then, but uh, he's a, a great guy out of the car as well. And yeah, as you said, those amateurs just need to be mistake-free. We see so often, especially in GT3, cars are a bit harder to drive, a bit faster. As soon as you make a big mistake, a spin, that's your, your day over, really. So you need to find that right level of aggression uh, and pace, and it's a, it's a happy medium between the two. Uh, 
I think trying to, one of the Lamborghinis are on board. I think this is Ballon now fighting his way back. He's caught the first of the, the century cars back there. And uh, yeah, he's got, he's got a long, long day to get himself all the way back up to where he needs to be. And it's easy to get a bit demoralised now, isn't it, really? Well, he can still salvage a decent result out of this race. This is for 12th position at the moment, and it looks like that was a fairly easy move made. I don't think that uh, J.M. Lippmann fought that one particularly hard, and so through goes the Lamborghini then into uh, 12th position now for Adam Ballon. As here, back to Kelvin Fletcher, who is really starting to uh, get busy now as he tries to find a way past the 42 machine then. This is for eighth position in GT4, but he might be about to lose ninth position because around the outside is coming the number 62 car. Uh, that's Alex Toth Jones. The outside line of Blanchimont is not necessarily a place I'd like to be, but then they're also being joined by another Aston Martin, that of Jack Butel now, the 35 car. So it's uh, very Aston Martin heavy here. And Butel goes right around the outside, tries to get the inside for the middle part of the, or the final part of the stop chicane, sensibly, I think, backed out of that one, but the uh, optimum team watching on with interest. They've got a car leading the race in GT3, and they've got cars right in the thick of the battle throughout their uh, GT4 race as well, but uh, it does look as though Kelvin Fletcher's being held up here, and the sooner he can get through, the better. He's in a precarious position at the moment, though, because he is rather getting backed up into the other Aston Martin, so the temptation is to say, well, if I can get past this BMW, I'll be safe but getting past the BMW isn't necessarily going to be that safe to do, so he has to be patient and pick his moments, which I'm sure is easier to do, easier said than done. Yeah, I'd actually, as the BMW, I wouldn't be worried too much about Fletcher, obviously Silver Silver for the BMW and then the Pro-Am entry, so the Silver Silver's got a pit stop penalty anyway that would put them behind after the stop, so if he's losing any time defending to Fletcher, then he's just losing out to the Silver Silver Astons behind him anyway time-wise, so... It looks like he's been fighting it for three or four laps and you, you always want to try and stop the tide as much as you can but unfortunately a lot of it as we see uh, into uh, the source hairpin graham johnson following uh, ratcliffe oh. through as uh, murphy was probably unsighted i would say there and i would put that down as a race and instant great opportunistic move from johnson using the gt3 as his uh, door wedge and i'd say murphy was probably unsighted by him and both continued to swap a position, but I would say uh, fair in my uh, uneducated opinion. <laughs> no, I think you know more than most about these matters, and uh, yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. No real harm done in the end. Kevin Fletcher still cannot get this position away, but of course that means the GT3 leaders will not be a million miles behind that little group now, and that could provide the shuffle of the order that he needs. Back to the uh, GT3 category then for a moment, and uh, specifically Sam Zahan, who has caught Rick Parfit now. That's a good bit of racing karma, isn't it? Not saying Rick did it intentionally, <laughs> but the uh, the penalty that was dished out to Rick for the contact on Sam Dehan has left him uh, on the same bit of track, maybe in the slight wrong order, but at least uh, there was no clear advantage for firing Dehan off there. And uh, these guys now can do battle for 30 minutes. It'd be interesting to know Rick's mentality uh, on there, um, because I wonder if he thinks he's at fault for the, the contact and uh, whether he should uh, almost let Dehan go for uh, a bit of good good karma and we're starting to get some track limit warnings now so like i mentioned earlier fia limit so as long as you've got one wheel on the tarmac slash white line that's legal but there's many many places at spa where going more than that is beneficial to your lap time so top of eau rouge we'll see from the camera guys trying to cut that margin as as close as they can and then entry to blanchemont and exit of blanchemont there's so much time there and although you're going a further distance in the in terms of blanchemont it's just the speed you can carry obviously works out as an average and then Oh, Rouge, you're just going a shorter distance and you're going faster. So, and you carry it all the way down the Camel straight. So, in testing, when I'm seeing what's possible, there's easily five or six tenths uh, at each of those corners. So, if you add those up a second, that uh, is definitely worth having if you're getting away with it. Uh, well, Rick Parfit not getting away with it because he's being warned for exceeding track limits, I think, at Blanchemont. And uh, we have a slow Audi that I think has spun. Now, this is the 29 car, the stellar performance car of Richard Williams. And it's crawling now. This looks like it's more, maybe a problem rather than a spin. Yeah, no puncher. It's so Crabbing, it looks, is it? Yeah, the rear left didn't look so happy in terms of its alignment, uh, which would suggest some contact side to side somewhere. If he's going there, it's most probably been the bus stop chicane, would be my guess. Uh, and if it's his left side, he might have been overtaking someone. As we now see this GT3, GT4 mashup happen, and this is where it gets so busy and so hard for every driver out there to judge what the other car's going to do, not lose any time, not have any contacts, and Fletcher's 
gone all the way around the outside of uh, Loggy there and uh, will now have the inside for No Name too. Loggy will probably be behind him for a little longer now. He's got past him now. So he's trying to position the car in a, a place that's obvious for the guy overtaking what you want from him, but also not losing any time uh, to your, your rivals in class. And it's there's no perfect lap with traffic, but there's better ones and there's worse ones for sure. Ian Loggy needs to get a move on, really, because Ryan Ratcliffe is now closing in on him. That gap was 1.6 seconds at the start of the lap, so you can see easily there how you can lose big chunks of time through no fault of your own, really, if you just catch the uh, a pack of GT4 cars at a tricky part of the circuit to overtake them, as Ian Loggy just did, then uh, you can sometimes find yourself losing seconds at a time. That can be so frustrating, and you sort of, I guess, have to have some faith that that's going to come back to you, and, and these, these things do tend to ebb and flow, but at the time, it's so tempting, is it, to just stick it down the inside and go for it, but that can be the end of your race. Yeah, exactly, and all the cars have a delta time, which is a display, which is saying if you're up or down on your fastest lap, and obviously when you get traffic, that goes one way, and it goes south so quickly, and you just know there's no way to get that time back, and I'm not clever enough to add up every lap that I lose, but you know if you lost us two seconds a lap before and three seconds this lap, you're five seconds down already, and before you know it, 30 seconds has evaporated, and, and that can be the difference between first and eighth, ninth place for British GT um, results. So it, it's hugely important. It's so hard. There's, as I said earlier, it's not a right or a wrong. The only wrong is when you make contact and the car's out. Um, so it, it's very hard, and you'll see them all more uh, experienced guys, the pros when they get in the second half, being a bit more decisive. I wouldn't say they're any more aggressive, but when you read the body language of the car, you can see what their intent is. Sometimes the AM, like we saw earlier with Balfanigo, it's almost too polite. It's hard to read what they want from each other, whereas if you're black or white, it's a bit easier. As we see Fletcher finally get the move done. Uh, that's a bit more like it. That was a big whistle as well. Um, and it looks like there's going to be a slipstream from uh, from Toth Jones as well. So this battle has been raging for the last 20 minutes. It's brilliant. I know. And the trouble is, when you run side by side into O'Rouge, you're so slow off the top of Radion that the cars behind get a real run on you. I don't think Toth Jones will get both of them, but he might be able to go around the outside of the uh, 62 car, maybe. Yes, he does. And here also comes Jack Butel. So three places lost. That is always the case, isn't it? Once you lose one, you open the floodgates and they all sense your weakness and uh, come diving through as well. So uh, sense driving though from the hallway avoided uh, any significant uh, uh, issues there incident between cars 20 and 52 no further action i don't know whether we've seen the incident between cars 20 oh it was the contact at last source wasn't it with graham johnson and Mark Murphy. no penalty for that as you suggested would be the case yeah as you see bradley s on the pit wall uh with his engineer Everett, and uh, so brad's got a lot of pressure unfortunately ollie's obviously leading the race got a relatively good gap but brad's got to get in and race against all the other pros, uh, which he will do easily, but he has 30 kilos extra to lug around with him. Um, so it's going to be difficult for him. He is praying not to have a safety car, basically, and Ollie for him to try and build his lead up as much as he can. Uh, another question from former British GT racer, only missing this round, I think, Andrew Howard, was asking, when was the last safety car in a Spa race? Do you know? Oh, I don't, you know, I have to, I know someone who will, though, Tom Hornsby, I'm sure, will be on the phone any moment letting us know, but it's, it's been a while, I think, hasn't it? Yeah. It's one of those circuits where, I guess, if you go off, there tends to be a runoff area to catch you and live snatch vehicles maybe to pull you out of the way. Yeah, uh, I mean, a safety car definitely would liven it up, but like we said earlier, the, the silver, silver entries always pray for no safety car because of their weight penalty to the Pro-Am. They need their silver, who is competing against the bronze in this first stint, to be able to have a unpeded stint. Yeah, absolutely. Safety cars can really turn the races on their heads. And uh, we've seen that before, but that's uh, not all that often here at Spa. So the race leader then is still Ollie Wilkinson, 3.4 seconds clear of Ian Loggy, who's 1.2 ahead of Ryan Ratcliffe. That's all been fairly static at the front. Graham Davidson, having cruised up to the back of them, has now dropped back a bit. He's five seconds behind Ryan Ratcliffe at the moment. And the second of the Pro-Am entries in GT3. Then it's uh, Sean Balfe in the number 22 McLaren that is in fifth position. Michael Igo is sixth, just behind the car that we're watching. Or actually, I say just behind. There are some 17.9 seconds between them now. And they were together, what, 15 minutes ago or so. So it's been an impressive uh, part of the synth this for uh, Sean Valve. Dominic Paul, 7th, Richard Neary, 8th, Mark Farmer, 9th, despite the spin. And Rick Parfitt, 10th, despite the penalty. So that's sort of the head of Class B, as we dubbed it at Donington last time. Those that have problems early on, which always seems to be the case, are sort of left fighting to be best of the rest. And that is Ballon, is it again, not? Into the bus stop. 
and there's a lot of tyre smoke. He's had a spin, I think, and we had to blanch him on. Either that or the engines blow, but that is the championship leading car out of the race. This is Possible complete drama, car. and yeah, almost certainly a full course yellow or a safety car for this. Now, the pit lane window does not open for another 20 odd minutes, so. We're not going to see anyone dive into the pit lane, but this will have an effect on There's strategy. possibly a bit of contact to the wall on the inside. I don't know if it's him or Ooh. the previous one. Yeah, that's uh, a little... I think little it's both the engine and an accident, isn't it? I think... Yeah, it's definitely spun on the exit. I don't know why. Uh, it's obviously nerfed the front right and then the, the rear of the car. It, to me, looks like he could get going, which he does, but the radiator there is leaking. Uh, so that's the, his race done. It will prevent a safety car, luckily for those silver, silver. But yeah, the radiator's completely done there. As he's hit the wall, what would have happened is all that bodywork has been forced back. And the radiator is so, so turning in, looks OK at the moment. Just it's loses at the apex. That is a, uh, a scary spin without stating the obvious. But from from the outside, I think Phil Keane, his co-driver, will try and analyse that and say what, what went wrong. But from just the onboard, couldn't really say anything. Turning was nice. Didn't look like he hit the apex curve. And the rear just went boom, just so quickly. There's no way he's ever going to catch it. Um, and that's obviously led to the, the long, long spin. But that car's done for the day. They won't be able to repair that. As I said, the bodywork gets pushed back and it will crack the radiator. There's none of that putting an egg in it and all that stuff that your granddad teaches you. That will be a, a big crack. And under that much pressure, when the radiator's hot, it will just be absolutely streaming out. Uh, there's no way to fix that quickly. So, nil point then for Barwell, uh, as far as the 72 car is concerned. Now, the 69 was on 95 and a half points coming into this weekend, which is, what did I say that was? About eight and a half points adrift. So, to score eight and a half points, um, which in this case would mean uh, finishing seventh place, that would put them in the championship lead, 69. Now, 69 at the moment are 11th, though. So this again continues to swing in the favour of the 47 Aston Martin of TF Sport, which still is solidly running in fourth place. Whilst that's been going on, meanwhile, I can see on the timing screen we've had a change for second position. Ryan Ratcliffe somewhere has got past Ian Loggy. Not entirely sure where that's happened. We'll try and pick up on it in a moment. But we have had a change, which means that the two silver silver cars now are both at the front of the field. Yeah, it's been a great uh, last 10 minutes, I'd say, from Ryan's really picked up a bit of pace and was catching Loggy anyway. So then to do him uh, is great. And we can see it's still quite close on track. Uh, but now it'll be interesting to see if Ryan will start to catch Wilkinson. As you said, both silver silvers. Be interested to see how their tyres are going off with that extra 30 kilos of ballast. One thing, I think it will be OK, but where balance comes into the pit lane with all that fluid leaking, it's obviously pretty slippy, the coolant stuff. So potentially as we see three wide with Neary trying to go around the outside there. And the Mustang did the right thing and didn't want to be anywhere near those two. And uh, was leaving them to their own devices. And uh, they all kind of get through safely with a bit of bodywork damage for Neary, maybe a front dive plane. But I just wonder in 20 minutes time when we see the pit window mm -hmm. open, will any of that fluid be left? And Spa pit entry is so tight. It's one line, it's two concrete walls either side. Um, so there's no room for error there. So if I was a team manager, I'd be warning my, my co-drivers, have a look on the way in, just to make sure it's fully dry. Um, I don't want to curse anything because a pile up there will be uh, pretty uh, catastrophic uh, for the race. We've seen it happen before, though, in some tight pit lane entries without the assistance of uh, radiator coolant. There's uh, a close up look at what the front end of a Lamborghini is not supposed to look like. But what it does look like after a meeting with a concrete wall coming out of one of the fastest corners on the circuit. And, and as you said, that was a slightly bizarre moment. Sometimes when you're midway through a corner like that, if you do lift or dab the brakes or something and transfer all that weight onto the nose, that can create a spin, but they've been lifting there anyway, so it's, it would seem odd that that's what caused it, but clearly something went pretty majorly wrong. Oh, definitely correct, and I'm, I'm learning stuff from you. This is all good for my racing. <laughs> As we see, Loggy spun oh, no. out the source. From third position, this is, so yeah. Graham Davidson will go through and gain more points, crucially. Horrible place to be stopped, especially as a left-hand drive car. Your vision's pretty poor. So there'll be a marshal on the inside, hopefully directing him when it's clear. Just a bit of unburnt fuel in the exhaust as he fires it up back into gear. Uh, strange to be in neutral in, in, in that position, unless he's just dipped the clutch to, to try and save the engine. But it looks like he's on his merry way. It'd be interesting to see how he got there, if it was aided, uh, which I'd probably say it's got to be at that sort of point in the corner. Very hard to lose a GT3 car at slow speed. The traction control systems are so good. Stops the rear wheels from lighting up. Uh, but as you said, uh, a lift at a high-speed corner back to balance point can unsettle the car. You kind of imagine you're driving a car, everything's nice and thing. You put a, 
a big input, it suddenly feels very bad. Uh, and I think we have Adam Ballon down in the pit lane with Andy J. Yes, Adam's with me. I've, uh, I've had to have a little chat to him about the language you use because he's rightly a little aggrieved at what's happened. Adam, you're, you're cross, aren't you? Yeah, I'm really pissed off. Pissed off at myself. Everyone else did everything right, but I didn't. <laughs> I mean, we just had a word about the language, didn't we? So apologies oh. for, for that. Is that uh, sorry, I didn't even <laughs> think that was terrible language. Slightly annoyed, slightly yes. irritated we all are. I am. Highly myself. frustrated. No, you're, you're cross with yourself, but... In the, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a complete disaster for the championship because you had a, a very strong position anyway. Yeah, but it's not about the championship for me. I wanted to have a good showing here. It's a great circuit. Um, we've done a fair bit of testing here, and it's just a really disappointing way to uh, to crash out, quite literally. Just talk us through what happened in, in, in your mind. Uh, well, I was going through uh, Blanchiment, and, and I, I was full on it, and I think I just put, had a slightly too much lock on at the exit car spun luckily it went down along the track had a little bit of a love tap on the inside wall could have been a lot worse i suppose when i look back i think that was going pretty fast backwards yeah. well you're safe the car's easily fixed it could be worse yeah it could could have been a lot worse disappointed though take care cheers for talking to us appreciate it well, Adam Ballon, we, we can understand his frustration, I'm sure, because I know he says that he's not thinking about the championship, but I'm sure that it's crossed his mind all of those nice championship points that he's losing, not to the sister car, but to this car. This is the car that is running now in third position. So if it finishes there, which it may not, because we've still got over an hour to go, but if it finishes third, it will score 22 and a half points, which will move it right into contention, not quite into the points lead, but right onto the tail now of the points leading Lamborghini. There's a Porsche there with some damage, which is the G-Cup racing car, which Joe has just spotted. Front end damage on a Porsche is usually fairly catastrophic, but I think they've got away with just bodywork damage, haven't they? Yeah, the new generation car, they've learned from having the radiators in the worst possible place is not a good idea, so they have put a bit more inboard behind the rear, uh, just in front of the rear wheel, sorry. But I don't know if he's gonna be able to continue with that, because if that bit of bodywork came off, Trying to work out what it is. It looks like it's a diffuser off another car to me. It doesn't look like it's its own bodywork. So it's obviously got hungry. Maybe it's its uh, front bumper that's peeled back. That's a lot of carbon fiber. To me, if I was to put money on it, that's either a Mercedes or a Lamborghini rear diffuser. So if we can find a, a rear one of those two models of cars, uh, that would be where I, I put my money. Looking at where he is at the moment, he's just been lapped by Ballon and Parfit, which means that a few laps ago, he was probably lapped by Ian Loggy, who had a spin at the first corner. I'm yeah. no Sherlock Holmes, but maybe, just maybe, that's where it came from. By oh, damn it, Holmes, I think you've got it. <laughs> I, mean, that, I don't know if it's intentional, but as he was running down the uh, old pit lane, pit wall into a Rouge, he actually rubbed the wall with that bit of bodywork. And if he did that on purpose to dislodge it, then that is absolute genius, because <laughs> I think that might solve the problem of him getting a mechanical failure flag. So we'll see if it has dislodged us. We see the GT4 back has been put on its head a little bit since we last saw. Collard has continued his pace and he's catching Dorlin now and he's cleared Ash Hand in the other TF car. We know that 43 BMW is out of contention. That was the car we had in the pits uh, having some suspension work doing. So hopefully he gets the message and gets out of the way um, and doesn't disrupt this battle because he's, uh, he's obviously not part of it. Um, as Collard is going to wear out that uh, headlight flash of stalk uh, anytime soon. This is, we've seen this again happen in the past as well, where GT4 cars that are a lap down on other GT4 cars don't necessarily get the message, but uh, I think the message is being passed on loud and clear here, isn't it, by Jordan Collard, by the flashing of the lights and good driving there. The 43 BMW gets well out of the way and uh, allows this podium fight then in GT4 to continue. And that answers my question as to which of the Prios will be on track. They'll both be on track together in their separate cars. How are the two Multimatic cars getting on? Well, Scott Maxwell, the car that's set Prio, Prio the Junior, will take over. He's running fifth at the moment in GT4. The 19 car with Sir Chris Hoy at the wheel is running 34th overall, which in about half an hour will be able to add up and work out where that is uh, in GT4. But it's outside of the top 15 or so. But when Andy Prio gets into the car, we know he's one of the fastest drivers here this weekend. Yeah, I wonder what a collective noun of Prios is, if it's Prios <laughs> or... Uh, yeah, that's going to be an interesting battle between those two. As you said, potentially it's going to be Andy catching Seb with where their teammates handle the car over to him, so uh, that could get quite awkward at the dinner table on Sunday night. Especially since the 15 car has a 20-second success penalty to serve for winning last time out at Donington Park. We haven't mentioned the pit stop penalties yet. We'll get to it in a minute. There wouldn't be spotted on the Ram race. Just want to see if it was the rear of that car that did get eaten by the Porsche or, or not. Uh, I think I think you're probably right with adding all the bits of the puzzle together. That's what happened and why Loggy spun. And 
We see Collard still flashing. Uh, flashing a teammate is uh, the lowest of lows. Uh, if I was Doyle in there, I'd be flashing my rain light back in uh, just at him. The heading, flashing of the headlights, sorry, is a, a strange one. In the car, it feels like the best idea possible. But then when you see it in the cold light of day, you realize it actually does nothing apart from probably distract yourself uh, than that. It's uh, a signal of uh, intent, but apart from that, really. Uh, right, OK, so uh, the, uh, I've always wondered whether that does actually distract the driver in front, but it would appear possibly not. So, uh, yes, the um, two Tolman cars then running nose to tail. And uh, ah, Tom Hornsby, as I thought, would have the answer for uh, Andrew Howe. The last safety car apparently as well was last year, uh, which I'd already forgotten. <laughs> And I was in the race, so I probably should have remembered. Uh, although you didn't cause it, though, did you? I don't think so. I've got a bad memory, but uh, no. I think, uh, unfortunately, my car retired, actually, before I got in it. So yeah. it definitely wasn't anything to do with me. I was ordering my way back to Brussels with uh, a portion of fries and mayonnaise as we see Loggy carving his way through the GT4s. And, yeah, it's missing a bit of the rear left there. So I'm glad we've uh, solved the case. <laughs> Makes me feel quite good that I've actually worked something out. If only I could have done that at school, I yeah. probably would have got some better grades. <laughs> you and me both. Uh, well, we're putting it to good use now anyway. Uh, not that it particularly helps Ian Loggy because I, he's already fully aware of how he ended up pointing the wrong way at uh, La Source. Uh, and he'll also no doubt be aware of the fact he's dropped him down to fifth position now and quite some way off the race leaders who have already come through to finish the lap. There is Scott Maxwell, by the way, the championship leading GT4 Ford Mustang. I was about to make the point about success penalties. So the top three finishers from the previous race in both GT3 and GT4 have to serve extra time in their pit stops. So in GT3, the winners last time out were the 47 Aston Martin. So it's been even more vital, therefore, for Graham Davidson that he's been able to put in this really impressive first stint because he's going to lose at least 20 seconds at the pit stop. The 22 McLaren, a Bolt Motorsport will have to serve 15 extra seconds in the pit lane and the Barwell 69 cars, if their day wasn't going badly enough already, are down in 10th place and they will serve 10 extra seconds in the pit stops. In GT4, the 15 Mustang of Maxwell and Prio will serve 20. The 57 HHC McLaren, which is running somewhere down the order, will sort, uh, serve 15 extra seconds. And the number five car, perhaps most significantly, the car then that is currently second in GT4, will have to serve 10 extra seconds compared to those around it. Yeah, and that's a, a lot of work as we see Sam Dehan cut the top of Oruja slightly uh, illegal without doubling him in, but he's got a lot of fight. And we see uh, a Porsche come in, actually ties in well with a question from Paddy's Motorsport about what happens with bodywork damage. We obviously see a lot of duct tape being thrown on it. And who, who says it's OK? Well, there's a champion, championship scrutineer, uh, John Crook, uh, which is a rather ironic name for someone checking the legality of stuff. And he will be near the teams and he will say if it's OK to go yay or nay. Uh, uh, if he deems it safe enough to rejoin the circuit, as we see Neary on the defensive into uh, Brussels corner there. The reason the Porsche is in the pit lane is not for a mandatory stop, and it's not even to fix the bad bodywork damage. It's because it's been handed a stop-go penalty for causing a collision at turn one, which we think we've now narrowed down to uh, being the, uh, the Ram Racing Mercedes that was on the receiving end. So they can't actually work on the car during that penalty either, so they'll have to leave that loose bodywork until it uh, makes its actual pit stop, which can be any time from about 11 and a half minutes from now. The first driver must do at least 60 minutes of the race and we are coming up to about 49 minutes into this fantastic seventh round of the British GT Championship. This is the fight for eighth position then. We're on board with Richard Neary uh, in the Mercedes chasing down Mark Farmer and right behind him Sam Dehan has a look at the inside. That's not really a place we see an awful lot of overtaking. Rick Parfit is only a couple of seconds behind this group and not far in front of them. Uh, is Dominic Paul in the BMW. So we've got most of the GT3 field here bunching themselves together. <laughs> the uh, GT4 century car says, I'm out of here, and almost needs to buy a ticket to get back into the circuit. So far into the runoff area was he to get out of the GT3 car's way. This is a fantastic battle. And again, a great mix of manufacturers. We've got a BMW just up the road, Aston Martin, Mercedes, Lamborghini, the Bentley catching them. This is why we love GT3 racing. Yeah, and this is British GT. It's so great for a, a domestic series. We see Parfit going a little bit deep there. And the, the SRO group do such a fabulous job of bringing this championship here, but policing it to a level where it's fair. There's been championships in the past where there's not only cheating, but unscrupulous behaviour from the driving front, which detracts from it. And all of these guys, honestly, when they wake up Monday morning, wherever they finish, know it's because they deserve that position, nothing else. There's always going to be swings and roundabouts as we see to hand. Pretty aggressive. Near he's not one to back out as well as he just backs out. And uh, Dehan is all the way through. And as they go through, Rouge 
Nero just lose a bit of downforce off the back of the uh, to Han's car, and I think we're going to see to Han probably get a uh, track limits warning soon. You can see how much that was worth <laughs> cutting the top there, and Oh Rouge is. When you see it on board, it's such an amazing... It's like threading a needle, wearing oven gloves, and you've had five too many drinks already, and you're sneezing. It's so hard to do right, and it's so much fun and rewarding when you do get it. And it's so important for the lap, because the straight that follows it, you carry all that speed for the next six, 700 metres. In fairness, I think Rich Neary had little choice but to back off. If he hadn't have done, I think that uh, Sam Dehan was going to join him in the passenger seat, because he was clearly asserting his authority there as they dropped down past the uh, old pit straight. This looks like two TF Sport Aston Martins at play and costing the two car a position there because Sam Dehan nice and neatly nips up the inside there because the GT4 TF Sport car wasn't exactly leaping out of Mark Farmer's way. So Farmer drops down into ninth place. But this is two positions gained on this lap by Sam Dehan. This is the kind of feisty driving we need to see from Sam, really. He's working his way steadily up into the points with the penalty the 47 car will have to serve. It will spend... 10 extra seconds compared to the 69 car in the pit lane, so that will further narrow the gap. So this might not actually be completely a completely hopeless uh, task here for the 69 machine. They might yet be able to, well, probably come away with the points lead after this weekend. Yeah, I think so. I think the, the hard thing is when the pros get in, there's very little difference. We see seconds being lost with the AMs. Like I said, the professionals with traffic are a lot more decisive and there won't be that variance. And, potentially for Johnny Cocker to have 45 seconds plus to try and catch Johnny Adam, who's probably Mr. British GT. That is a, a very mean feat. But yeah, if Sam Dehan could do some of the work now to close the deficit as we see track limits getting more and more liberal towards the end of the stint, tyres going off, drivers going off. Um, we start to Ooh, see a Michael drivers Igo. going off. Yeah, that's good timing. <laughs> it's very tight to get around there. So he's had to lose so much time and he'll even lose time all the way now into the source as we see tries to go around the outside the gt4 Ooh, leaders yeah that was threading the needle with oven gloves on and he must have been on the brake so hard to lock the tires up the abs in this car again like the track control so good he must have been praying for his life um where we go through uh all the way through to our rouge now as we see more side to side and Neary does what the hand did to him the lap before so monkey see monkey do there obviously works and he's got the position i think poor mark farmer uh, was probably a little bit worried what was going to be uh, going on there it's been a decent stint this farmer bear in mind he was pointing the wrong way about 15 minutes into it he's actually done quite a good job to uh, fight his way back up to this group but now he's about to lose another place there that looked as though rick parfit was alongside him so things not going quite as well at the moment for mark unfortunately let's see how that worked out basically the entire g GT3 field have got themselves together with the GT4 race leaders, the four and five McLarens, right with them. So this is what happened down at La Source. After Igo's spin, the uh, we're going to see some contact here, I believe. Farmer, oh yeah, rattles into the side of the number 18 car. Uh, again, trying to take full advantage of the fact that Igo had just been off the road and was maybe a bit rattled. There was definitely a gap there for Farmer and made the move. It was an aggressive move, one that I'm sure his co-driver, Nicky Team, would have been proud of. Sadly, though, a corner later, he ends up losing ground because Richard Neary gets alongside him, shovels him to the edge of the road, and Farmer actually lost three positions out of all of that because back three went Igo, and Rick Parfit was able to take advantage too. So this is a real... Oh, that was uh, a very wide line there for Richard Neary. So Richard Neary then, in the Mercedes, has now worked his way, I reckon, into eighth position, but Sam Dehan has got himself ahead of all of them. So Sam Dehan really driving well now into seventh place then eighth for Neary I reckon and then this is the fight going on between Parfit and Farmer for about eighth or ninth position ninth position it'll be because they're still behind Mike Ligo and Parfit trying to get up the inside of James Dahl in the GT4 leader who was going to leave in room but again that's back to what you were saying Joe about the Amdrivers not being quite as decisive maybe in the traffic yeah he kind of did the worst of both worlds there unfortunately Rick he showed his nose so the GT4 leaves the gap but then doesn't act on it so they both lose out a pro I think in that situation either shows his nose and overtakes as we see I think that Porsche has that just been spun round or has he kept it there was a Porsche somewhere in the middle of that mix and I think the TF Aston might have just helped turn him around uh, yes, you're right. Well spotted. Uh, so that's, it's been an eventful day for Seamus Jennings so far. His stint is nearly over, but he was on the receiving end, it would seem, this time of some contact. And uh, 
we may be able to catch a replay of that. We'll see what we can do for you. But the Porsche, great to have Porsche back in the championship in GT3, even if it is just a, an all-am driver entry. Uh, a few people have been asking why that car isn't mixing it right at the front. Well, that's why. It's two amateur drivers, both just doing it because they enjoy it. Uh, possibly not enjoying this afternoon quite as much, but uh, the car fires back up and thankfully gets back on its way. There it is, going slowly. Has it got a puncture or some suspension damage, mate? Oh. Looks like it's bonnet boot. I don't know what you call it on a Porsche. <laughs> boot, boot bonnet. The boot bonnet, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, that's definitely uh, in an unoptimal aerodynamic position there. So he's going to have to pit again. So he had to stop going. Now he's got to pit again. And then in about four minutes, he's got to pit again. So I don't know, actually, if I'm, a, I'm not clever enough to work out, but it might be better to go slowly and enter the pit lane after mm. the pit window opens, and it might lose him less time than boxing out, box again sort of thing. Uh, I don't know which TF car was involved with it it was not this one so i think it might be yeah. davidson um obviously higher up the grid and lapping the Porsche. so hard to say really what uh what car that was for sure right okay well uh, we'll try and piece it together maybe we'll chat to graham davidson during after his pit stop i'm sure andy jay can be dispatched out to tf sport because uh, graham will have a few stories to tell i think after this stint that he's put in this is the race leader then ollie wilkinson we haven't really seen him and that might lead you to believe that he's leading by a country mile but he's not actually he's only two and a half seconds clear of ryan ratcliffe who's been doing probably his best stint of the season he did the same sort of thing here 12 months ago didn't he put in a really great defensive stint in the second half of the race on that occasion uh, when he was the pro driver partner Rick Parfit at Team Park Racing uh, and got themselves a podium finish and it was a real turning point for Ryan as far as his confidence was concerned last year another really good stint here he's two and a half seconds behind Wilkinson the race leader Graham Davidson is 1.1 seconds further back so the top three are all going to be on the Kemmel straight in fact Davidson is not 1.1 seconds back because Ratcliffe has been held up in some traffic through a rouge I think and now Graham Davidson is attacking for second place goes to the outside here into Lake Cobb that'll be the inside into the left hander but Ratcliffe was always going to turn in and the big Bentley was almost always going to win that battle as well if there were to be contact so sensibly Davidson again preserving this championship margin backs out of it but Davidson will have to serve a 20 second success penalty he is 17 seconds ahead of Sean Balfe so if he could get on with this and get past Radcliffe there is a chance actually that Davidson could come out still in a podium position but this is uh, very close stuff indeed. The top three cars then, all within 3.7 seconds of each other at the start of the lap. This is Sam Dehan gaining another position now. That's sixth place for the number 69 car. One of many drivers who are already, I think, up for the unofficial driver of the day award. This has been a brilliant stint from Sam uh, to fight back. Not only has it been a good stint as far as the moves he's made and the ground he's made up, but being able to get over the disappointment of everything that went wrong on that first lap, we sort of hinted at the time, it would be very easy for him to get a bit disillusioned with the whole thing and think, well, what's the point? We're not going to score any points now. But he hasn't. He's got over that and has put in a really good drive now to get back into the top six, which we never would have predicted 50 minutes ago. Yeah, especially without a safety guy. He's done that all on his own merit and work. And yeah, sometimes you, you see it in a lot of sport when people are angry. It normally goes one or two ways. In tennis, it always seems to go the wrong way. But I've had it in motorsport where I've been fired up for various reasons. We see the two Tolman DDP backed McLaren run cars. So bit of history on this so ddp stands for driver development program it's a program mclaren really believe in picking young drivers to try and come through the ranks and become a factory driver and I'll, i guess ultimately take my job one day <laughs> um but we see james dorlin in the four car and jordan collard in the five going battle here and great to see them both in their first year of gt racing leading british G gt at spa so hopefully these guys have got a good future um and we can work together without me getting fired but uh yeah, going back to Sam DeHaan's point, I think he would just be so fired up. It would be almost like devil may care attitude. Like, well, I've got nothing to lose, so I might as well go win it or bin it. And so far, he seems to be trying to win it rather than bin it. So it's, uh, yeah, so far, I'd say he'd probably be my, uh, my driver of the day. Um, I don't really think anyone else has outperformed him over the stint. If he finishes in the top seven today, he and his uh, teammate Johnny Cocker, they will take the championship lead by half a point if they're seven. Of course, the further up they go, the, the more comfortable the margin will be. So at least there is some hope here for Barwell Motorsport. Plenty of hope for Tolman Motorsport, though. This has been a really strong showing again for both of these cars. The better placed of the two in the championship is the number five car, though, which is the um, car that's third in points in GT4. Jordan Collard and Lewis Proctor, who will take over for the uh, second stint of the race. They won back at Snetterton, but then had a retirement at the next race uh, at Silverstone, which has cost them slightly, but they arrive here at Spa, 20 points off the championship leaders, who they are ahead of. Now, what of the championship leaders? Well, Scott Maxwell is still only fifth in GT4, but only actually about five or so seconds behind. 
replay here of Graham Davidson trying to get past Brian Ratcliffe, not able to do it on that occasion. So Team Park Racing Bentley Continental GT3 stays ahead and there's still uh, oh here's another Bentley Continental GT3 with the TF Sport Aston Martin behind this is Rick Parfit and Mark Farmer uh, and they are scrapping for 10th position at the moment Mark Farmer another driver recovering from a spin Parfit recovering from a penalty after he tipped the 69 Lamborghini into a spin this though is all getting very tight in GT4 and it looks almost as if and I hesitate to say this but it does look almost as if the McLarens are holding each other up slightly now and allowing the TF Sport Aston Martin to close in behind. Yeah, and unfortunately, they, they will most probably box this lap, so I would actually say it's fair game for Dorlin to defend, because that's going to help his teammate, Josh Smith, be in front of Lewis Proctor, as we see the first car take its scheduled pit stop. Uh, it will be thick and fast now. Everyone, I think, will stop as soon as they can. Want to get their faster pro driver in if they're pro-am, uh, and also fuel round here, with it being so full throttle, there isn't really much scope to go much longer than an hour round here for most cars. They were the top two cars in the GT4 Championship, and they both have penalties to serve. The 15 Mustang, 20 seconds, and the 57 McLaren, 15 seconds, because they were first and second at Donington last time. You're absolutely right. James Dorlin is defending the race lead in GT4, and why shouldn't he? Uh, they may pit this time, but of course, they are silver drivers. So there's no huge advantage to having one driver in the car or the other. Maybe if... Collard feels he's getting held up here. He might be on the radio saying, can we pit this time and try and get the undercut done? Yeah, it could do. And I think uh, I'd definitely want to box if I was uh, with Collard. Tolman, I think they've got one fuel rig and then they use dump churns. The way the regulations are, you can only have one fuel rig per two cars. So as a team, you'd rather just box one one lap and one the next. But from a strategy perspective, that might not be advantageous. So it's going to get busy in that pit lane and you suddenly see five, six seconds evaporate if a mistake's made. And as a driver, that's infuriating because you're looking at gaining tenths of a second and suddenly you lose multiples of that as we see something shred from the front of that Lamborghini. It was the Bentley, I think. I think it's okay. the grill cover of the... Um... There's also a little bit of damage on no, that there front is, left. Right. I, I, that's the dive plane that looks very uh, happy and uh, standing to attention. <laughs> so as he boxes, I think that would just be uh, to either rip it off or try and fix it back down. The valve car going through that refueling process. So 127 litre fuel tank in the McLaren. So that'll be fully topped up as we see the driver change going on. So refueling first, and then once the refueling finishes, then the tyres and driver can do can be changed so not all three activities at once looks like used tires going on for uh, Brady Ellis that's most probably his qualifying tires although it was a wet qualifying so it must actually be his free practice ones so they might have scrubbed them during free uh, during warm-up sorry so now they've got to wait for their minimum pit stop time so it looks like they're ready which they are but unfortunately as a driver you're just sat there waiting for the engineer with that lollipop to release you and then obviously the pit lane needs to be clear as well so you can't just go when it says zero you need to make sure you're blending in to a clear pit lane and you're not going to impede anyone so this is the race leading car then we're, we're looking forward i think now to a fascinating second half of the race because we're going to have the two silver silver entries at the front aren't we optimum and team park racing and they'll have a decent lead over whichever of the Pro-Am cars comes out in third, because both this car and the 47 car that was uh, fourth and third, respectively, have success penalties to serve. Oh, hang on, what's going on here? It looks uh, like they're still within their pit stop window, but yeah. it looks like they're just going with a bit of blue roll, maybe, uh, maybe Sean got a bit excited or something, just needs popping up. <laughs> so back to the point I was making then, the, uh, the silver car is going to have this big lead. But then it's the pro drivers that are going to be in the cars behind them, which should, in theory, be quicker. So it's going to be one of those typical races where they're catching, 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 and then right at the end, they probably all get together, and we have a real grandstand finish. So this is, again, again the way the regulations work with allowing the silver-silver entries to compete against pro-ams, it does all even out over the race, and it provides us with some pretty thrilling climaxes. Yeah, and I think added to that, both uh, Ellis in the Optimum Aston and uh, Getty, sorry, in the Parker Bentley are both quite robust drivers i will say uh they're very uh, confident with knowing where their car is so they're going to be hard to pass on top of that so yeah all those pros need to get past those two guys who are going to be hanging on for dear life to get on the uh, on the top set of the podium as we see chris hoy coming into the last chicane makes a lovely noise this mustang and he's obviously going on a little bit longer than uh, some of the other guys so they're they're not unleashing andy prio just yet I wonder how long we stay on board but so what you're going into here, Le Sauce, so 180 degree hairpin, you're hitting the brake, staying to the left, bringing it in, and you'll see the wall on the inside 
his eyes will be looking for his exit point. A little bit of oversteer. Rear tyres go off normally before the front in a rear-wheel drive car, just because the amount of energy they have to deal with. You can see him looking in his mirror as Sam Dehan came down the inside of him and then throw erosion off you go for another seven kilometers and 20 turns of spa. But what a circuit it is as well, and a real thrill ride for these drivers. No wonder Chris Hoyt wants to come in, and actually he's getting plenty of miles under his belt this weekend because he's also racing in the Caterham 420R Championship a bit later on today, where he was in the top 10 yesterday. The 69 car that just passed him is under investigation for an incident with car eight, which is the team Abba Racing Mercedes. Now that could be that little shimmy they did on the run to Eau Rouge. Also under investigation, <laughs> Uh, you couldn't really conscript this, is the 47 Aston Martin for that contact with the 33. Now, of the two, maybe you'd expect the penalty to go to the 47 because that was a genuine look from what we could see anyway, like it was you know, a proper hit up the rear of the Porsche that sent it off the road. What is your view, though, I'm fascinated to hear, of the 69 car? Because that would seem a little harsh, would it not? Yeah, I think from what we saw, it was a bit like they were both playing Russian roulette and it looked like... Unfortunately, Neary had the bullet and uh, Dehan got away with it. it. It was aggressive and not particularly nice, but I don't think anyone wants to be nice and win championships, right? So as we see a real mixture of GT3 Mercedes on GT4 on GT4 Aston and GT3 Mercedes, bits of bodywork and stickers flying off the cars. But yeah, I, I'd be disappointed if Dehan got a penalty for that. I think it was robust, uh, again, that word, but fair. Um, as we see, Ratcliffe box, the only right-hand drive car, which actually makes it really annoying to do a driver change because you're right next to the fuel rig. Uh, but obviously, British uh, Bentley, right-hand drive. Um, only us, the Commonwealth and Japan, I think, are right-hand drive countries, so it's a limited market, but they stuck to their guns there on that one. Well, this is all four position now, and of course, because of the success penalty the 69 car had to serve, it's back behind the eight car now. So the drivers in play here, Ben Green in the BMW, Adam Christodoulou in the Mercedes, and Johnny Cocker in the 69 at Lamborghini. This is all for position. We're not entirely sure which positions yet, because it all needs to shake out with the rest of the, the uh, pit stop, but it's going to be somewhere about sixth or seventh, I reckon. So Sam Dehan with work to do again. They're also in amongst some of the GT4 traffic, some of which has not yet pitted. But uh, Johnny Cocker has just set the outright fastest middle sector on that previous lap, I think, despite the uh, traffic around him. There's more traffic coming out of the pit lane. And that's the 37 Aston Martin, isn't it? With now Darren Turner on board getting stuck straight in. Now, I'm not sure whether that, I think that car's a lap down, actually, because yeah. uh, it fell down slightly in the first in. Beautiful looking car, though. And they're going to be racing here in the 24 hours next week. So they're very much using this as a, as a shakedown for that. Yeah, and Tony Quinn is co-driver. I don't think we actually saw that car once in the opening stint. Uh, Australian guy, uh, New Zealand actually, I think that's rather offensive to him, but yeah, I've, I've met him, he's a brilliant character, it's a shame we didn't get to see more of him. Uh, bought an Aston Martin Vulcan for the race track he owns in New Zealand and, uh, as, a, as a safety car. And I remember talking to him asking, what, what do you do for business? And he goes, I shoot kangaroos and sell them as dog food. <laughs> so uh, he assures me that the, the business is legitimate and he hangs out of a helicopter shooting kangaroos, gets paid by the Australian government to shoot them and then turns them into dog food and gets paid twice. So I guess that's how he Whatever you need to do, uh, uh, that's some all and a uh, lap down, but still they shake the car down for the 24 hours next week. Oh, that gap's going to close. I could see that coming, and Ben Green knew it as well. Back down to it, but Chris Tadulu seizes the opportunity, gets alongside. Right, left, right, sequence of corners, and so the inside of one corner is the outside of the next, and frustratingly for Chris Tadulu, he can't prize this door open, and he's very wide. Oh, that, this will be a move and a half, right round the outside. He's going to run out of road again on the exit there, almost in the gravel trap, and uh, Johnny Cocker not quite close enough to take advantage. That was robust stuff there. Ben Green was not for letting him through. No, it was, it was almost like a chess game there, with that jag kind of just being in the middle. You had to choose if you wanted to go left or right of him, and who's going to help, and actually ended up kind of helping both, as we see. Ooh, ooh. A big old moment turning in there. That was uh, not as bad as the Ballant incident, but again, turning in, you could, even from the forward facing onboard, you could see the rear of the car snap, and you're doing 145, 150 miles an hour. That is a big moment, and uh, luckily now the improved safety here at Spa, that's all tarmac. Six, seven years ago, that was still gravel. That would have been uh, a large off, but uh, yeah, you can push the envelope a bit more now with all this uh, namby-pamby tarmac everywhere for us modern drivers. I know, I know. It's so terrible, isn't it? Well, I have to say, it probably didn't help that he was running about half a car length behind the BMW as well, which I think that was as graphic an example as you'll ever see of what dirty air does for the car. It's not just front downforce that goes away, it's downforce full stop. And uh, these GT3 cars, we've made the point, they do rely on their downforce. And uh, when you're within touching distance of another car at the fastest corner on the circuit, 
you can't really expect it to stick to the circuit like glue. Mr. Dulu trying now to fight back against the BMW. This is the problem, Macy. You're trying to sort of pick your moments and think, well, well, I'm quicker here and he's weaker there. But if you catch a bad marker at that part of the circuit, you have to abort, don't you, and just wait for another opportunity. And then equally, sometimes the traffic can create an opportunity where you weren't expecting it and you have to pounce. Yeah, and you're trying to see where that traffic is going to get caught. You can obviously see some points of the track as we see a very slow that 57. That is the 57 car, second in the GT4 Championship. Sorry to cut across you there, Sorry. but that is the car that uh, had served its pit stop penalty anyway, but the 57 car now uh, in the hands of uh, Dean McDonald, yeah. Callum Poynton, Dean McDonald, I think, yeah, Dean McDonald taking the second stint, has made its pit stop but was going slowly. We'd like to keep watching this battle of course but that was a significant car in trouble and there it is and of course it's extremely rare that you see a McLaren breaking down like this it, it, there's no smoke there's nothing hanging off it that leads me to think it may well be electrical and unfortunately electrical gremlins can strike any car can't they yeah definitely it just looks like it's coasting to me uh, and all the way from the, the top of the Camel straight all the way to this point here into Stavolo 1 it's downhill so I don't know where he's going to plan to coast it if he's turning it off and on on the fly uh, to try and get some life back into it. But yeah, I think you've called it right because there was, there's no visible problems with it. And all of the cars now, the electronic systems are so, so complex and uh, that only takes one issue and the whole system gets knocked out uh, and it, it's hard to overcome. And sometimes an off and on can reboot it and sometimes, unfortunately, it's terminal. But for their championship, let's, uh, let's hope they can get that sorted. Uh, yeah, so that plays into the hands nicely of the 15 car. I'll, give, uh, I'll have a stab at giving the GT4 order in a few laps. I don't think everyone's quite finished pitting there yet. The GT3 they have, so the order in GT3 is the 96 Optima Motorsport Aston Martin back out in front. That's Bradley Ellis now on board. Oh, back to that in a moment, because that was a close moment there for Adam Christodoulou, who was trying to be decisive in the traffic, but the traffic was being slightly less decisive and sort of lingering in the, lingering in the middle of the road. Right, there is your race leader. Bradley Ellis there leads the way by... 13.7 seconds now over Glingetti, who is in for Ryan Ratcliffe in the number seven Team Park Racing Bentley Continental. He is nine and a half seconds ahead of Johnny Adam, which makes sense. Johnny Adam was about three seconds off the lead. He served 20 seconds extra in the pit stop and has now dropped to 23 seconds behind. So that is the starting point then, plus 23 seconds uh, between Johnny Adam and the race leader. But Johnny Adam is the highest placed pro driver chasing down the two silver entries in front of him. Rob Bell is into the 22 McLaren. He's 11.7 seconds further back in fourth. Um, Callum McLeod is in for Ian Loggy now. Oh, and the 57 car stopped. I did say it stopped going down here at Stavolo 1, and that's about Stavolo 1, so... I think you're right. Unfortunately, I've ran around here, so I do actually know <laughs> how uh, hilly it is up and down. And if he can't fire it up, then gravity is no longer on his side, and that is a very bad place to be stopped without stating the, the very, very obvious. And that safety car word that we keep haunting is if it does come out then unfortunately Ellis and, um, and Getty are going to be really really struggling as we see a, a warning flag on the left hand side there you can just see a 47 flashing so that's most probably track limits um, it's for the car not for the driver so if Graham Davidson had used them all up then Johnny Adam unfortunately inherited that it is a 10 second stop go penalty for contact with the Porsche oh. so that is real drama then for the 47 car that is in third place at the moment um, and uh, that was potentially set to inherit second place at least maybe even the championship lead and they will have to serve a 10 second penalty now they are almost exactly 10 seconds ahead of Rob Bell's McLaren, so it may not cost them a position. They might come out of this okay. Unfortunately, the 10 seconds plus the pit lane time, uh, 28 yeah. seconds here at Spa, so it's probably going to be like 40 by the time you add that into the equation. So, yeah, so it looks like uh, today no one wants to win the championship, which is, I guess, lucky it's not the last round, but uh, yeah, as we see, and uh, uh, like I said, I'm sure there was no intent from Davidson. It wasn't for position. But from the quick glimpse I caught of it, it did look like it turned the Porsche around. So everyone's going to shuffle up the pack now. It'll be interesting to see where that uh, HHC McLaren has ended up. For me, it's, it's too on the track to be a live snatch where they bring either a tractor or a 4x4 on to bring it. That only really works when it's off the track. Um, but if we haven't had a safety car now, then hopefully it's uh, rebooted and got on its merry way.
yeah, even if you can just pull off the road, then that's better than nothing, isn't it? So, uh, uh, right, I'll try and carry on with this order, although it's going to change again now because of the penalty for Johnny Adam. Ben Green is sixth in the BMW number three. Adam Christodoulou seventh in the number eight Mercedes. They're the two cars on screen right there. With Johnny Cock of the 69 Lamborghini next in line in eighth. Seth Morris is ninth, but under investigation. In fact, now being given, being given a one-second stop-go penalty for too short a pit stop. Oh, 57 cars gone as far as the bus stop. It's stopped again and then fired back up again. So that's good news. Dean McDonald is off the track. Bad news for their championship. And this uh, championship curse seems to be striking GT4 cars as well as GT3. So, yeah, penalty then for the 31 car of Seb Morris. So he will drop out of ninth place. That will hand it to... Nicky Team and the Dane train will be well into the top 10. He's just set the fastest lap as well as Nicky Team. Two minutes 21.406. Dennis Lind is 11th in the WPI Lamborghini. Ben Mitchell, uh, sorry, Jack Mitchell is uh, 12th, not uh, EastEnders character Ben Mitchell. Jack Mitchell is 12th. Darren Turner is 13th and the last of the GT3 cars. In GT4, it is the number four car that leads the way. That's Josh Smith then, who we are watching there. Uh, and not uh, far behind him is the number five car. But between them is the 97 Aston Martin, which is now being driven by Tom Canning. So it's Smith, Canning and Proctor. McLaren, Aston Martin, McLaren, Aston Martin. In fact, the top four, because the 95 car of Josh Price is fourth. So it's looking good for Tolman and TF Sport in uh, GT4. And rounding out the top five, Michael O'Brien in the number 20 McLaren. Now, I believe we can bring you some footage of what happened between the 47 Aston Martin and the 33 Porsche. Oh, oh that's the Porsche and the... Uh, right, because that's the other incident. That's the number six uh, Ian Loggy-driven Mercedes getting punted out of the way. The incident we really need to try and see is the... 47 car into the back of the 33, which is what the penalty has been given for. We don't have a full replay, but we may be able to possibly find you some footage of it in the near future. So, 43 minutes to go. Take a deep breath now, because I get a feeling it's all going to start to uh, boil up now to a real crescendo in the final uh, third or so of the race. These lead gaps in GT3 are coming down. Uh, Rob Bell now into third place after Johnny Adams just served that uh, stop-go penalty. Rob Bell, on the previous lap, was near... Well, he was over two seconds quicker than the race leader, but he's 31 seconds back not convinced he's quite going to get there, which may well be good news for Ollie Wilkinson, who has just got out of the 96 Aston Martin. Bradley Ellis is in it now and in the race lead, and Andy Jay is down at Optimum with the man who led the entirety of the first stint. Let's find out, shall we? Ollie, it's a case of job done for you, isn't it? Yeah, um, you could say so. Um, it, was a, it was a hell of a stint, really. Uh, I managed to get away for a good start, and then really from there, just get my head down and, and keep cracking on from there, really. How's it feeling out there? Because it, it looks pretty darn hot. Uh, yeah, it was warm out there today, if I'm being honest. I was using the air con, though, so, you know, that, that keeps us relatively cool, so it wasn't too bad. There's quite a few teams, when they, they say the word air con, they don't know what that is out there, so you, you're pretty lucky. Uh, what do you think? You've, you've got a fair bit of the race to go, but you're in quite a commanding position. Uh, yeah, I think we're looking good where we are at the moment. Um, I, I think, you know, all, all going well. We could, we could well be on for a podium, if not a race win, but obviously this is motorsport and anything could happen between here and the finish line, so I wouldn't play any like to say right now. All right, well, we'll We'll, we'll keep a watch on it. Thank you for talking to us. Yes, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. So, Ollie Wilkinson then happy, but also nervous, no doubt, now, because he's done his bit. Now he has to watch his uh, co-driver do the job. So, if we think that Rob Bell... Well, for, OK, first of all, Joe, do we think Rob Bell is too far back to catch the race leaders? So he may catch Glingetti, I suppose, but do you think he can catch Bradley Ellis? The gap is 29 seconds. So, we should have 18 laps give or take one or take two of my, my bad mathematics. <laughs> so he's doing two seconds a lap quicker, right? So 36 seconds maximum he should be able to catch. So it's plausible. Uh, is that two seconds going to be consistent every lap? No. But Bradley Ellis's and Glingetti should deteriorate quicker because of that weight. So if it's two seconds now with another 40 minutes to go, that lap time should only get bigger, the deficit. Rob obviously has to clear Glingetti. That's not going to be zero time loss. There's going to be time uh, devoted to just getting past Glyn in the Bentley. And then he has to make chase. Uh, as we see, this battle's still raging on. And so far, it's actually looked really clean as well. And I think Krista Lulu might have it just about now. And as he tucks past Ben Green. And it's interesting now to see what pace Adam has to uh, get away from this group. Yes, they are about 17 seconds behind Johnny Adam now, who also fell behind Cal McLeod as well on the previous lap uh, as a result of that penalty that they had. So Adam is down to fifth place now. 
Johnny Cocker, the other championship contending GT3 car, is eighth, though, so they would at least gain some points. It's all going to be very close as we head to Brands Hatch, the ultimate round next time out. GT4 leader about to go another lap down to this little group, which are still fighting away, I remind you, for sixth position with Mercedes having just taken it. So there are another couple of positions here up for grabs for Johnny Cocker, perhaps. He might have just managed to make better work of the back markers. Can't quite get to the inside, but if he can gain these two places, they could be very valuable points indeed. Yeah, the rate that Nicky T is catching, though, unfortunately, at the moment, you would say he's probably more likely to lose the position in the next five or ten minutes, the way the attrition has been going. His track limits at the last uh, one as well as we jump jump on board. Mercedes with Malvin, I think, against Plowman. Ooh. How's your mother? How's your father? And uh, through he goes. And uh, uh, I would actually say, so it's in Scott's defence, and Scott and I have had some good battles with that sort of much contact. I would have done exactly the same as Scott, but I think he was slightly in the wrong. I would, in hindsight, probably give the position back to Plowman and look to do it again a little cleaner. The problem is that right-hander there in the middle of the coupe, it's not, you don't break, so there is no real speed deficit. So what uh, Malvin has done there is literally just thrown that GT4 Mercedes into a gap and given Plowman the problem, and Plowman's turned in like he has to, and the problem's created the, the, the contact. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, rope robust is my word of the day yeah. so i go with it again <laughs> and it's what i would have done but i think slightly in the wrong um so we have andy j in the pit lane with ryan ratcliffe who had uh, another mega stiff yes ryan you told me just before the race you said right my plan is to jump from p3 to p1 and then make the car as big as possible mission almost accomplished you got to p2 yeah i didn't really go to plan my, my plan um I mean, Ian Loggy had an amazing start and he got past me. Um, so, spent a bit of time trying to get past him. Um, by the time I did, uh, Ollie had built up a massive lead, so it was just sort of trying to chip away to, to reel him back in. But to be fair to him, he did a really good job. Um, our car felt really nice, to be fair. Um, so, I'm happy with it. Um, yeah, Glenn's out there now doing a pretty good job. Uh, he seems to be keeping the McLaren at bay. Uh, I think we got a 13 second lead over it. Um, I'm not sure. Still a fair bit of time to catch P1 though, isn't it? Yeah, I think the leader's got a sort of a, a 13 second buffer as well. So um, we'll see though, anything can happen. It's Spa, it's British GT. There hasn't been a safety car yet, which there usually is every year. So uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, uh, I'm pretty happy where we are right now, but if you can catch the leader, then that'll be awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Now, if you're wondering what's happened to Ryan Ratcliffe, um, he's not going through a bad time. He's um, apparently the, the lack of hair now is as a result of some money that he's been raising for charity, Joe, and actually not an insignificant amount of money either. No, I think it's £14,000 for uh, Cancer Research UK, which is a, a brilliant cause. I mean, he wasn't a great looking guy anyway, so to do that to your hair actually wasn't that much of an issue for him. So, yeah, great to see it. And he's probably worth a few tenths of a second as well uh, with the weight saved. Uh, well, that, that is something, actually. Yes, Jeremy Clarkson made the point once that he was amazed Formula One drivers are allowed to uh, grow beards and whatnot, because surely that's uh, worth a few hundredths of a second a lap. So this is the number seven car that Ryan Ratcliffe was in. Uh, we are going to try and go back now to this uh, incident that was uh, that saw a penalty go the way of 47 Aston Martin. This is all we have of it, so uh, make the most of this. Yeah. So there are the two cars at the back of this group. Now, Joe, what, what can we see here? So it looks like Davidson's trying to get the run on him and it just hasn't quite judged the length of the front of his car and it's such a gradual little nudge, but as you see, it's enough to fully rotate the Porsche, which I think then hits the barrier on the left-hand side and that's why that bonnet boot thing pops up. And I think, unfortunately, yes, it's not for position, but the race director's done exactly the right thing. Davidson has caused an accident and has to be punished for it. There was no intent, there was no benefit for him in doing it. It was just a mis misjudgment and... Uh, Unfortunately, when you're, when you're on the edge and you're pushing hard over a lap and then over a championship, those sort of things are going to creep in. Now, you know we've been saying no one wants to win this championship in GT3 or GT4. Well, after the 57 HHC Motorsport McLaren has sort of... Oh, I'll get back to this in a moment because Johnny Cocker's getting back to it again here with the number three BMW of Ben Green side by side into a Rouge and he goes through. So Cocker then into eighth position now. Again, uses a bit of the uh, curb on the exit of uh, Eau Rouge and Radion. Green will try and fight back, it's not like he'll be able to. Uh, so in GT4 then, the 57 HHC McLaren has sort of handed this on a plate to the 15 Ford Mustang. 
which is now under investigation, or will be after the race, for a pit lane incident with the sister HHC car, 58 car. Now, usually that means an unsafe release, but we don't know who it was that was released unsafely. We aren't being told that, but uh, that's just another little cloud now over this race for one of our championship contenders in GT4, that, uh, and it's not really nice to leave the circuit not knowing exactly what the result is. 35 in the garage, I'm afraid. That is uh, Conor O'Brien in the... Optimum Motorsport, Aston Martin. That's a real shame, Connor. I used to coach Connor, one of the loveliest kids you'll ever meet. Slightly weird, but really, really nice, and has really committed this year to British GT. A good test programme of Optimum and the new Vantage GT4. Shame to see what the car, why it was in, and what the problem was. Really, it looked like it was quite hot. They had a fan on top of the engine, but it didn't look like in a mad rush. So either means it's terminal, or they don't know what it is yet. So uh, yeah, 34 minutes to go. Hopefully, they get the car back out and get some laps for Connor out there as we see this. GT4 battle really hotting up. Uh, as we saw before the pit window, it was the two Tolman cars together. Uh, the five car had a 10 second penalty from its previous uh, third place at Sneston. So that's why the five car is a little bit further back. It wasn't a bad pit stop or anything on that car's fault. But it'd be interesting to see if this flows the same way as it did in the first in. The four car started off quicker, then the five car catches up, and now we've got a 97 car in the, in the sandwich of Tolman cars. This could, uh, this could turn into probably be the best battle of the, the race we've got remaining, I'd say, at the moment. TF Sport, I think I'm right in saying, haven't won a race yet in GT4. No, they haven't, so this would be their opportunity to do so, perhaps, through from Seb Morris in the GT3 Bentley. And uh, see, no sorry, you just see the Aston Martin really aggressively dunk in behind that Bentley, the biggest car out there. So if he could have got the slipstream there to try and get past the uh, McLaren, and that's what you'll start to see as they both run wide. And it's completely different being up here. When, you're, when I'm driving and racing, all, everything I do is legal, and that would have been fine. But when you watch it from the outside, some of the, the track limits, guys are really taking the mickey, and I think uh, we're going to start to see some penalties coming thick and fast. You've, you've basically got four lives. So first, first three go completely unnoticed. Fourth one, you get a black and white warning, which is your final, final chance. It's kind of like a yellow card in football or rugby. And then it's straight to a drive through penalty on that, on your uh, fifth issue. So. As I said, the car carries the penalty, not the driver. So if you're a co-driver who started the race, used it up three of them, you've got one to go wide before you get the penalty. And I'm definitely seeing a lot of cars seeming to use up a lot of their lives quite early on. So the big hot spots, this one here on the left. So you can see both those look legal, got one wheel on the track. That's all good and you can carry on. But yeah, you've got effectively five lives before you get called up into the pit lane. The 42 BMW is on its second warning, we're being told, for exceeding travel to turn 17, which I think is Blanchimont. So uh, that's the corner at which these two both run wide a lap ago. So through Lacombe they go. And uh, ah, TF's last GT4 win was 2014. That is almost impossible to believe. Thank you again, Tom Hornsby, for uh, uh, sending us all of the information. And uh, there we go, 2014. So um, they're long overdue a victory, and they are now in second position right on the tail of the race leading uh, McLaren. Another incident that's being investigated, by the way, is, and this is not going to be a great surprise, the incident between car 66 and 11. That was Scott Mulvan and Martin Plowman. I think we both know which way that one might go, but we'll uh, wait. It's only under investigation for the time being. Uh, pit stop infringement for car number nine is also under investigation. That will <laughs> further improve the mood down at Century Motorsport because that's their GT3 car being uh, investigated now for some sort of pit infringement, too short to stop, speeding, unsafe release, could be any any one of a number of things, really. So we move now towards the final half of this race. The lead gaps at the front are staying fairly stable between Ellis and Getty, but Rob Bell is on a mission. He's now 19 seconds off the race lead. He was about 23 or 24 off it, so he's gained about four or five seconds, five or six seconds, maybe, uh, on the race lead. And he's 7.8 now behind Rob Bell, with Callum McLeod still fourth, and Johnny Adam in fifth position and set to take some points out of the Barwell cars, but not really as many as it looked like they might do earlier on this afternoon. So I've got a few more tweets coming in. And like I said earlier, if anyone's got any questions that I can try and answer live on the air, then uh, Twitter Osborne Joe for me as we see the GT4 battle rage. Got a few that are coming. Got uh, Jack Goffer, I think, uh, normally races those touring cars. They're not quite as good as these things, but he's obviously trying to convert himself. Him and a friend, Cy Shaw, normally watch football, and they're, they're asking, what's the best way to get to British GT? And 
any of the races, you can just buy tickets online, come along, and uh, if you, any of you guys come into the paddock, I'm more than happy to show you around the cars and show you what proper motorsport's about, basically. <laughs> it is a real assault on the senses as well, isn't it, GT racing? That's one of the things, whenever I introduce people to motor racing, it's usually either touring cars or GTs. Touring cars because it is that sort of, you know, really high-paced action sort of racing, but GT racing, it's this assault on the centres of the car, look amazing, they sound amazing, and the racing, as we've seen, is pretty epic as well. Uh, down in the pit lane, where things are maybe starting to calm down a little bit now after the pit stop window, uh, is Andy J. Andy, who have you got for us this time? James, just tell me what you're seeing, because this is quite exciting, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those races where, I mean, luckily we managed to get a good start, but then you're just punching a hole in the air for everybody. So, um, as you saw in my stint, I just had the whole pack right up behind me the whole race, which uh, really does put the pressure on. Um, and now, as you can see, Josh is under exactly that same pressure from the Aston. So, uh, but you know, I've got all the, all the faith in him. So, hopefully, we'll uh, we'll have a bit of luck this time and uh, come away with a win. Which is harder, being in the car or watching the car? Well, I thought being in the car. Now I'm out. I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, like I said, I've got all the faith in Josh, and he has got a good car underneath him. We know it's running well, so just fingers crossed now we can bring it home. He's got to hold on for half an hour. Yeah, that's going to be the longest half an hour you've ever seen. <laughs> and it's certainly in your case, for sure. Yeah. Um, thank you for talking to us. Good luck. No worries. Cheers. James Dorlin, who came so close to winning the Renault UK Clio Cup last year, only for a post-season penalty to... Um, unfortunately demote him to second which is not really the way you want to lose it um, but uh, he's had a bit of a torrid season so far as well theirs was the car that broke down before the race had really started at Donington Park last time out and now here they are trying to defend this lead so what do you think then your professional view does the Aston Martin look like it is handling better is it managing its tyres better where do you see the strengths and weaknesses between these two so I'd say the Aston's a little bit quicker, hence why it can stick on its bumper. But I'd say the McLaren's just got the top speed advantage, and that's probably why we haven't seen the position change at the moment. Um, we'd probably need to see a bit more to see exactly what's going on as we see team on Krista Dulu there. Ooh. Krista Golo's in deep. I think he's trying to hang it around the outside like a trailer park girl. Unfortunately, gets shown the, the hard shoulder. Off he goes again, but Nicky's progress through the field is just unreal, absolutely amazing. For Sam Dehan to be the best in stint one, even with half of it left, Nicky's uh, really showing these guys what's for as we see them all back up behind a GT4 car, all kind of brake test each other, not on purpose for necessity so they don't run into each other. But yeah, Nicky's absolutely flying here. You'd probably say this is the last position he's realistically going to get. It's a big gap then to the cars in front. But again, a safety car comes out, then uh, it's all about track position. So he needs to try and clear Chris Adulu as quickly as he can. I'd probably say his best opportunity is either going to be into the bus stop or into Lakuma after the Kemmel straight. The top speed of the Aston seems to be its biggest positive against the Mercedes, as we saw in stint one with the Ams driving. That Merck had the power just to cruise round. Sorry, the Aston had the power to cruise round the Mercedes. If he gets past Chris Tadoulou quickly, he's only about seven seconds behind Johnny Adam. But again, then you start delving into the team politics, don't you? Are they really going to take points away from the 47 car? If Nicky Team had his way, I know what would happen, but I, he may not be able to make that final decision himself. That's only really if he gets past Chris Tadoulou in the next lap or so, which in fairness looks like uh, it is definitely on the cards. Out of Blanchimont they come, back towards us. If I peer out of my window, I can see them coming towards us with the sunlight glinting off the bodywork. And that new Aston Martin has got a distinctive new sound to it this year, but I have to say it's a very nice design and uh, a little more slippery maybe in a straight line now, maybe than the old Vantage, and that possibly is what's leading to it having this uh, apparent advantage in a straight line. Yeah, I think that and it aided, it's gone to turbo now, so the torque that turbo's... Uh bring to the, the whole drivetrain and that's really the future of, of motorsport everything's going turbo you go smaller engine so you get better fuel efficiency but then when the turbos kick in you get more torque and more power that way so we're watching for a rouge listen for a lift tiny one as he turns right a little bit illegal from both of them but kind of fairly illegal on both parts and now he's in the slipstream that extra torque we talk about as we go back to the gt4 battle and the aston similar sort of sat behind him Back to uh, team on Chris Lou. Chris Lou covers the inside. It's, I think he's probably got to be a car length closer as they get through Eau Rouge. So he's, he's then got an opportunity to get around the outside of him. You see how much is going on with the windscreen of Aston Martin. So you've got two braces in the middle. That'd be to stop any big debris coming through the windscreen. It's, although it all looks like the road car, that'd be a polycarbonate plastic windscreen rather than glass. So it's not particularly strong. So they support it there. 
And then you see in the right-hand corner, the two black boxes with the wires, they're GPS aerials for the data systems and camera systems. So there's a lot of complex technology in these cars these days. And yeah, there's a hell of a lot going on for the driver behind as well. And he'll be working away, trying to work out where Chris Adunia's weakness is, like Neary there through Puan, bit of a slide in the middle of the corner, but just looks like the Merck's got the advantage in sector two, the more mid-speed downforce corners. And then it looks like the Aston's got the advantage, maybe the end of sector three and sector one, which is all about top speed. Uh, just to take us back to GT4 for a moment, no further action in the incident between Mulvern and Ploughman, which is interesting. So they clearly decided it was a racing incident, and uh, I'm sure Martin Ploughman disagrees, but uh, Scott Mulvern able to take the place uh, and keep it. So that's that uh, one little box tick then. We've got our answer to that one as Nicky Team is still struggling to find a way past Adam Christodoulou, and every time he gets close enough to attack, there's traffic up the road. Yeah, this could be interesting. Uh, McLaren right in the middle of Blanchemont's going to really hold Christodoulou up. If he can get, it would almost be like a restart on Christodoulou, as we see the Abfab Swedish McLaren get out of the way well. And yeah, just Christodoulou's doing a wide, wide job here. He's going to be looking for the cutback, so he'll go to the left-hand side now, Nicky. Again, the traction on that Mercedes is brilliant. It's really, really good. You can see it pulling away there. So it's kind of safe, I would say, in first, second, third gear corners. It's then fourth gear and above, I'd say, the Aston is stronger, and that's really what we see through Rouge and beyond. Seems well planted, doesn't it, through the high-speed corners, the Aston Martin. There's another back marker in the way now. It looks like one of the GT4 Aston Martins, which Nicky will be determined to get past before he hits Rouge. Can he get there? Oh, just about, but that was heart in the mouth stuff but if he loses a second or two there it could take him another two or three laps to gain that time back so they have to be decisive and the gt4 drivers i'm sure get a bit frustrated at this sometimes because they feel like they get elbowed out of the way left right and center but if they were in the gt3 driver's position they would do exactly the same thing they have to make the progress as soon as they can struggling to make progress is tom canning he's been latched onto the rear bumper of this mclaren pretty much since the start of his stint about 40 minutes ago and he just can't find a way through. Two more evenly matched cars, you can't really hope to find out there. You sense it will take a mistake from Dorlin, or maybe he can take an opportunity when some of the GT3 cars come through to lap them. But even under braking, they're almost identical, aren't they? There's just no advantage to either car. Yeah, I really don't think one of them's stronger than the other one anyway. So as you've right, rightly caught, it's gonna be a mistake on, uh, on Smith's part that Canning's got to be pouncing on. And maybe Canning would be advised, you can't believe how much space they've got at the moment around them <laughs> but he might be better just to back off a second because he's not really under any pressure from Proctor behind who had to turn serve that 10 second penalty and sometimes what you find when you back up and then you close back up to the car you get that momentum and you can actually carry that speed past him whereas if you're just following him you can't really do anything about that to gain the speed on him anywhere so actually it kind of looks like he hasn't left that gap as soon as I've said it so it'll be interesting to see how this goes and really we're getting into tyre management now is which tyre is going to go off quicker You've got the engine in the front of the Aston Martin, so that's going to work the front tyre harder. Likewise, in the McLaren, it's mid-engine, so that's going to work the rear tyre harder. So it's going to be how the teams are set, the pressures, the cameras, all the setup. Ooh. As we see Dennis Lind really on the back end of uh, Ben Green there. And yeah, Dennis has got a bit of work to do, obviously, after Igo's uh, couple of issues in his first stint. Uh, yes, uh, Jack Goff watching from home, probably very familiar with that sort of driving. That was extremely close, not quite full on contact, but a little bit of a uh, tap in the tail. Oh, Seb Morris in trouble. Seb Morris slowing in the Bentley. That looks like a rear right puncture or suspension damage or both, maybe. We think, well, they've been in the pit lane a few times anyway with penalties and whatnot, so there's something wrong with the back of the Bentley in their season again has really unraveled after that really strong start with the win at Alton Park. It's just not gone to plan since then. They were disqualified from Silverstone, and now another retirement on the cards. Oh, well, we cut away there to Nicky Team, almost running into the back of Martin Plan, who's had a lively stint, but the battle between the WPI Motorsport Lamborghini uh, of Dennis Lynn and the BMW of Ben Green was getting feisty into the first corner as well. Nicky Team has uh, lost some ground now, but look at the way that they are catching. Uh, all of a sudden, Johnny Adam is only a couple of seconds up the road from him, in fact, less than that now, so uh, there's something... Um, a miss possibly there for Johnny Adam, I think, because he had the 47 car really getting hampered in traffic, but they can't really afford to lose any more places. And we were saying it was unlikely that Nicky Team was going to catch his teammate. Is this a problem, do we think, for Adam, or is this... There's a lot of time for Johnny to have lost in traffic. He was about, uh, what was it, 12 seconds or so in front of them? Yeah, I think it'd be interesting if we can stay on a little bit longer to see what the car's looking like. It looks OK under traction, so he's got enough power. Looks OK for a left-hander, so there's no problem with the suspension, particularly on the loaded side, we'd say. Let's check under braking. 
Adam eats in a little bit, but that can just sometimes be the concertina effect. Throws up the dust in his face. Try and block his radiator. Looks OK, so it could just be a really, really bad run of traffic. Like we said earlier, it's quite easy to lose a couple of seconds. Do that five or six times as your, your 10, 11 seconds. But yeah, it's not like Johnny. Johnny's Mr. Brooks duty, as I said, he knows how to handle all of this. And yeah, I mean, I, I really don't get it. My, my most logical thing is like, they're going to use Johnny to back Adam up into Nicky, so Nicky can overtake him. But that is way too far fetched as a conspiracy theory. So this is going to be a, an amazing battle now. I think the cars are all in the wrong order, you would say. Nicky's quickest, but third. Adam's second quickest and uh, in second, and Johnny's at the moment slowest and the leader of this three car battle. More traffic ahead as well as they come through Blanchemont. How will this play out, I wonder? Adam Christodoulou trying his best to apply the pressure. It's the Invictus Racing, this game's racing Jaguar, even if Christodoulou drives round him. Yeah, that didn't look right, did it there, for Johnny Adam. He braked significantly earlier than he normally would. He's not pitting, so he clearly feels he can manage it, but he's going to keep losing places. Yeah, so saying under braking. We know the suspension looks all right from how it's handling, so it could be an ABS issue. Where we saw him braking earlier into Puon isn't such a big brake zone, whereas where you go into the bus stop, you're hard into the brakes. And if Johnny's lost the ABS, he simply won't be able to brake as hard or late and get the car stopped. So he maybe is just nursing an issue uh, to get the car home, but yeah, that car has lost performance. So I wonder if he's, he's uh, gonna get caught potentially by Cocker and even Lind if Link can clear green. Right, this is, uh, yeah, Lynn trying to go around the outside of Ben Green, right on cue. Uh, we're hearing Seb Morris has been in for a tyre change, they've changed that rear right tyre, so maybe it was just a puncture or something in the wheel itself, but uh, either way, there, Dave, going back to worse, and now, yeah, through goes Nicky Team, that was always going to happen, wasn't it? So the Dane train steams through into, into uh, fifth position now, yeah, so... Oh, no. Sixth position, get that right in a minute. So he's ahead of Johnny Adam now. Fifth position will be the next target, Adam Chris Dooley up the road from him. And uh, there is Seb Morris going through, almost a lap behind even some of the midfield GT3 runners now. So uh, the 42 BMW now on its third track limits warning in uh, GT4, the car that uh, started on pole position, the uh, sister car in a way to the number three Century Motorsport machine that we're seeing now. And uh, the two of them head down the hill here with uh, Dennis Lind still very much in the wheel tracks of the BMW in front of it. Uh, just to let you know, by the way, the 33 Porsche with Greg Caitlin at the wheel has pitted. Uh, it's in the pit lane into retirement. So somebody was asking uh, Joe on the Twitter about that. That's where it's gone. It's had a rough day, hasn't it, the Porsche? It had the uh, uh, damage, a penalty, and then uh, got nerfed into the barriers by Graham Davidson as well. And uh, that rear damage, I think, possibly was the final nail in the coffin, wasn't it? That looked fairly significant. Uh, yeah, and I think it's hard. Uh, both, in, both arms in that car, as we highlighted earlier, these cars are so expensive to run in the region of 30 to 40 pounds per kilometre of running costs. So if you're running around in the back and you're not going to get any chance of a good result, then parking it in the garage does save you quite a lot of money and uh, yeah, you can maybe get the earlier crossing back home and be home for uh, for Sunday night. But yeah, thank you for that question, Marcel. We'd, we'd missed that one. I've got a few new people watching today, which is good. So Nathan Down, thank you for tuning in. It's good to have uh, people joining British GT, a championship that I've always loved. But uh, with the coverage now, we've got it live at Spa as well now, which is brilliant. We can watch all the way around the two hours of Spa, which is it's new for us. We've only ever had it at the, uh, the British tracks before, I believe. So yes. I always like uh, coming here and watching cars going hammer and top. Which they have been. And look at this. This could not be any closer. Dennis Lind is almost in the boot now of the BMW in front of him. In front of them, meanwhile, Scott Mulvin's attack continues as he tries now to get past the uh, McLaren, which is a lap down, I believe. Dennis Lind just can't quite prize this door open, although he's got a good exit from La Source, and I think that might just have done it, but they've been here before side by side, and there's traffic in front as well, which is Martin Plowman's Aston Martin, which way do they go? Oh, they're almost leaning on each other, someone will have to give here, and it's not going to be Dennis Lind, he goes through ahead of Ben Green, nicely done that, he had to do that before they came across this Aston Martin, and now he can pull out and pass it fairly easily, so down the Kemmel straight they go then. And uh, that puts Dennis Lind into ninth position now. Next target will be Johnny Cocker, though, who's 18 seconds up the road. Well, Green fighting back here into Lacom. Going to be good on the brakes, it would seem, but uh, no, can't get through. Oh, Mulder's trying that move again up the inside into the final part of Lacom, and that was uh, this time on the 58 HHC McLaren, which has had its troubles as well in this race. 58 uh, is running at the moment down in 
uh, seventh place, I believe, in the, uh, as far as the silver cars are concerned in uh, GT3. At the head of the GT3 field, by the way, things are getting rather tighter now. There were only about three seconds between Glingetti in second and Rob Bell in third. And as they flash past us out the window, I can see they are almost nose to tail now. So the second place battle is beginning. Rob Bell, at the start of this stint, was 24 seconds off the race lead. With 15 minutes left, he's 10 seconds off the race lead. So as you said, the deeper into the stint we go, the more that ballast seems to be affecting the silver cars. And Rob Bell might yet do you think be able to get into this? So we've got five or six laps left, depending on how the uh, checker flag falls on the leader. So nine seconds is it, still doable. It is all about how quickly Bell can clear Getty. And uh, I think we've seen this gap now. It's, it's obviously closing quickly. And we saw earlier when Sean Balfe was in the 22 car that it was top speed that seemed to be the McLaren's strongest point. So Rob will be hoping he can cruise up to the back of that Bentley, get a slipstream off it and just drive straight past it with no real time loss. Um, so it looks like we've been following the camera for a bit. It looks really planted. It doesn't look like Rob's got any handling issues whatsoever. The car's nice and planted. Big dirty V8 making a nice sound as he accelerates out of Brussels. And there we have the top three. Lovely shot into uh, Puon. And uh, yeah, it be interesting to see how it goes. I think uh, we've got Rick Parfit in the pits with Andy J. Be interested to get his take on everything. Yes, we certainly do, Rick. It started so well, and then we've just seen the car come in with what looked like a rear puncture. Uh, what's going on? Oh, it's just Spa has served up its usual, uh, its usual carnage, I guess. You know, um, we knew we had a uh, good straight line. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see the strengths and weaknesses of the different cars. So the Lambos are very, very quick through the twisty stuff. We're quick in a straight line. And so it's a bit of a cat and mouse game. And so at the beginning, you know, um, I had a cracking run on Dahan and um, thought I'd given him enough room. And obviously we came together. It was unfortunate. Uh, you know, sorry, sorry, Sam. But I, I thought I'd given him enough room. It's one of those things. It wasn't, wasn't malicious in any way. Um, both of us were just fighting over the same and I was coming back on. So it's a shame. But, you know, uh, and um, from there on, it's just gone from bad to worse. I think um, we had a pit stop infringement we were one second under um, and so that's put us back and um, yeah that's kind of it really so far oh yeah and a puncture so but that's racing isn't it you know 99% frustration 1% elation and um, today's 99% it gets in the end doesn't it sorry mate thank you for talking to us <laughs> Yes, thank you, uh, Andy, <laughs> with uh, Rick Parfit, who always has a smile on his face, regardless of how badly things might be going out on track. And, the show uh, must go on. It, well, it must, indeed, and he, he understands this, and he pours his heart and soul, doesn't he, into his racing programme, and uh, he's reaped the rewards in the past. He is a former champion, let's not forget, uh, along with Seb Morris, his co-driver. Right, this is Nicky team. The BMW is a lap down, but the Mercedes in front of him is not. Um, what of the battles right in front of the field? Only 1.4 seconds now separate Glingetti in second and Rob Bell in third. You do not know where to look, as is always the case when we get into the final portion of these races. It seems that there are always about 16 different battles going on, but there is one for second place, which is developing now. Rob Bell needs to get on with this. We were discussing off air whilst uh, Andy was talking to Rick just now whether we think Rob Bell can get there. And I think it all depends on how long he spends behind this Bentley. If he can get past Getty quickly, there is maybe a chance, maybe, that Rob Bell could get there. And this could be his opportunity because one of the GT4 McLarens is in the way. That maybe cost Getty a mile an hour or so off the corner, but there's not really much you can do about that through this sequence. The middle sector is, unless the car in front makes a mistake, more or less single file, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It flows left, right, fast, medium speed corners. and. Yeah, you get one car at the wrong point, it almost feels like you lose your momentum for the next two or three. And yeah, we see Rob really closing up here now, and this is probably where the, the McLaren's stronger. You can get on top of those curbs. You can see the Bentley looks like it's dancing around on its tires. It's probably worn and the pressures have gone higher. When the pressures go high, the tire literally feels like a, a beach ball and you're just floating around on it. And I think it's easy to forget that the Balf car also had 15 second penalty from its uh, its podium at Snetterton. So it's less than 15 seconds away from the leader. So if it hadn't had that, as we see Ryan the Egg looking on and uh, he's got a lot of stress for the, the next uh, 11 minutes or so, hoping Glyn can hold on. It's almost a guaranteed podium, but second is one of those positions that sounds a lot better than third for whatever reason. So, yeah, it's going to be a titanic scrap for uh, the podium positions, I think. They have had a second place finish in race one at Stetterton, have Team Park Racing. 
the best finish for the McLaren, meanwhile, uh, has been a second place finish also last time out. They've had two podiums this season, but they are really now on the coattails of the Bentley. They're 7.1 seconds off the race leader with 10 minutes to go. Ooh, looking for the better exit from La Source, but Getty had it covered, moved to the right-hand side of the road, then shovels him back over to the left-hand side, where uh, Rob Bell tried to get himself alongside. Whilst this battle is raging, by the way, significant move for seventh place. Johnny Cocker is ahead of Johnny Adam now, so that's the second place car in the championship, now ahead of the third place car in the championship, and that puts them into seventh place, which is just enough for the 69 car to take the championship lead by, I think, half a point based on my very rough mathematics with two races to go. It literally couldn't be any closer, but the outcome of this race is still up in the air here. Rob Bell needs to get a move on here. As soon as he's got stuck behind Getty, he's going slower than Bradley Ellis, the race leader, in the first sector alone, lost half a second. Yeah, and there's, you see how aggressive Glynn is now with his defence. He doesn't care how much time he loses because he, he's given up that he's not going to catch Bradley Ellis in front. So he can devote all his attention to defending from Rob, whereas Rob is trying to spin two plates here. He's trying to clear Glynn and then get on. They could get a good cut back here. You can hear he just had to lift off the throttle just at the apex so he didn't run into the back of him. I think that lost his momentum to uh, try and get the overtake done down the hill into Pool. And so his next real opportunity is going to be into the bus stop. And Rob is obviously vastly, vastly experienced. And what you're seeing him do here is just drop back a length or two. Once he knows you can't overtake him for the next couple of corners, and there's no need to just follow him in the dirty air. That's Ryan's mum, the better looking of uh, his parents. That's where he gets his looks from. And um, yeah, so Rob is just keeping his car clean. And then he'll try and charge it back up again, look to get a good exit potentially get these GT4 cars in front to help him. Um, but yeah, really here, I think his best opportunity is going to be bus stop, the source, top of Eau Rouge, and then a camel straight. And I think that's about it. But that's four opportunities. But I think we've lost the opportunity of the, of the McLaren winning the race. And I think Bradley has done such a good job. He's been metronomic in his stint and he's just kept the lap times plugging away and it's just meant that the gap's big enough to defend from the, the non-weighted Pro-Am uh, McLaren. More traffic there, the race performance Ford Mustang leading the way and Getty almost comes to a standstill there trying to avoid hitting it but of course Rob Bell has to react to that and slow down as well so again no real advantage gained there. They just put a lap on the 42 BMW, by the way, which is being investigated for contact with said Morris's Bentley. Again, we don't know which way around that might go, but they're clearly the two cars that made contact that forced the JRM um, Bentley into the pit lane. This Bentley, though, doing a good job of filling the track, which is something Bentleys do quite well, uh, but Clint Eddy is having to drive defensively here. A good exit through Eau Rouge would help Rob Bell, but again, in that dirty air, he just can't carry the same speed as Getty, can he? No, uh, and that Bentley is so aero dependent, so it's great for being in the Bentley, but when you're behind it, all that air that is coming off the back of it just means it's disrupted, basically. So the McLaren hasn't got a consistent airflow over its wings and diffuser, so it's hard for it to generate the same downforce as we see uh, McLeod there in the Ram Mercedes getting close, and that's all because Getty's on that defensive, so suddenly that podium that looks so certain of those three cars <laughs> is uh, could be a four-car fight for three positions. On the previous lap, as Nicky team goes side by side with Adam Christodoulou into Eau Rouge and goes through, so that's fifth position, would you believe, now for Nicky team? Track limits, what track limits? Uh, into fifth place he goes, he's not going to catch anyone else, he's 37 seconds behind McLeod. Well, this has been a storming drive from Nicky team. Wow. This is the battle in GT4 now, Martin Plowman is back with Scott Mulvern and might have a score to settle here. He's probably thinking, well, the, the clerk of the course hasn't settled this score for me, so maybe it's time for me to dish out some justice myself. The next corner is probably not the corner to do that, but maybe into the bus stop. He might just fire one up the inside. These two are scrapping away over 23rd place overall, but crucially, third place in GT4 Pro-Am. Remember, the 11 car is leading the Pro-Am GT4 category in the championship. Through the bus stop they go, almost running into the back of the 58 car, which I'm pretty sure is... Oh, that's also for position, actually. That's for that's a silver car, but that is for GT4 position as well. So these three are all fighting for... Um, overall GT4 positions, but the Mercedes and the Aston Martin fighting for something rather more significant to them, which is a GT4 Pro-Am championship battle. Down the hill into Eau Rouge. Where can Plowman make this move? If anywhere, he's almost pushing Malvin down the hill. Now, uh, Plowman, he, I'm, I'm sort of saying in jest that he might dish out some uh, justice here to Malvin, but he's not going to be gentle with Scott, is he? After what happened earlier on. He's not going to do anything dirty, but he's certainly not going to 
give him any slack, is he? Yeah, the bar's been set. Yes. Uh, so you can play to the rules that have been given to you, and the rules have been laid out earlier by that move. So, yeah, I think eye for an eye at this point would be fair, and the race directors obviously also agreed with that uh, that move as we see this three-car battle again. Malvin lost a bit of time trying to get past the McLaren, but places the car somewhere which Plowman can't do anything about and has to check up. So. Interesting. Uh, I was amazed that Malvin's pace at the start of this season has really dropped off. I don't know if there's a problem or the tyres have just gone, but he was uh, he was streaking away from Plowman, and now it's rolls reverse. And this last five minutes looks like you'd want to be in Plowman's car rather than anyone else's in that battle. Um, so, yeah, a couple of laps to try and settle the score on Plowman's uh, on side. I think it uh, Martin's one of the fairest guys out there, so I don't think anything underhand will happen. But. Yeah, he's got, uh, he's got some ammunition to try a slightly different move, potentially, to what's uh, been the norm here today. Yeah, well, this is very close indeed. And the 58 car, as I said, of Luke Williams is also in this uh, battle for position. So Marvin's in the, a bit of a difficult situation here. He's very much the meat in the sandwich. And they come through the middle sector now. Speaking of being the meat in the sandwich, Rob Bell has now been fully caught by Callum McLeod. So if we ever dare take our eyes off this battle, the fight for second place overall is getting very tasty indeed. And right on cue, here they are. Rob Ball with the McLaren in second position. Going through the uh, double apex left-hander at Puon. And now Rob Bell has to watch his mirrors as well as look out of the windscreen. Because as we said, Callum McLeod is right with them now. So... Um, Geddy is slow because maybe the tyres going off, whatever the issue is. He's also defending, both of which are backing Rob Bell into Callum McLeod. So at one point, does Rob Bell says, say, right, well, if I keep being patient, I'm going to lose a position. I just have to go for this. Yeah, and it, it's trying to find what's the best opportunity to do it. And it, they, ugh, it looks so close again. I thought the McLaren was going to have a better top speed than the Bentley, but it doesn't look that way. And it just looks because the Bentley is so aero dependent, the McLaren can't follow it that well. And that's why the pace has deteriorated so quickly. And Rob hasn't been able to get past him. So I think as we see Morris maybe looking to try and do a fourth pit stop if he gets some more contact. Um, two biggest cars out there. If they drive like that, no one's going to be able to get around them for a few laps. <laughs> Um, I think Rob's just got to try and line up a move on the brakes and hope that Glyn leaves a little door open, can maybe dummy back, but he's going to the outside, so then McLeod's got the inside on Rob, and he's oh. gone a long way deep. If he can get it round, oh, three wide, this could potentially This is going to get interesting, isn't it? Callum McLeod's got a better exit than both of them, and I think they are three at rest past the old pit lane. <laughs> Look at this for second place with three minutes left on the clock. Rob Bell gets his nose in front. Someone will have to back out of it, and none of them do. Three of rest into Erosion. McLeod gets both of them from fourth to second. Phenomenal racing. But now Glyn Getty will try and fight back. You can tell he used to race in touring cars, can't you? He's got a better run. He's in the toe. He pulls to the outside line. And Rob Bell may yet benefit from all of this. As around the outside goes Glyn Getty in what is turning into a real hammer and tongs battle here. But McLeod on the inside line will prevail and goes into second place. What fabulous racing that was. I do not know how Callum McLeod managed to thread the needle, but he did. And he's into second place. I've never seen that. I've never seen three <laughs> GT3 cars wide into a route and all three make it. And it'd be fair. Um, yeah, I think Glyn did everything he could. Rob had to be on that side the way he did it. And then McLeod was only left with one option, which was the best option, is to be on the outside for the left, but the inside for the right. And uh, yeah, great racing. And uh, it's a shame we've only got two minutes left of this race. As we see, Rob's in front. Glyn then gets the run. Then McLeod has the inside. Glyn has oh. to back out. McLeod has a big old tank slapper. They both cut the top. And then Glyn's in the slipstream, but doesn't manage to get back past him. But oh, kudos to all three of them. I think that's the only time I've actually been grateful to be in the commentary box, not in a race car. And I've been watching those three. I don't know uh, which one I wanted to be at the start, but uh, yeah, great job to all three of them. Your eyes were on stalks, just sat here in the commentary box. So imagine what the drivers were feeling like there. But that's, they're the moments you live for, surely, as a race driver, especially if you're the Callum McLeod of the situation and you just passed two cars up the inside into a rouge. They're the moments that live in your memory forever that you will never, ever forget. And we were don't forget that in a hurry either. Fantastic stuff. And uh, Callum McLeod then into second position. They've been on a good run mid-season, haven't they? The uh, the uh, Mercedes squad after a disappointing start to the year that we documented a bit earlier on. They then went and uh, won at Silverstone, did Ian Loggy and Callum McLeod. They had a good pace at Donington as well, but a late issue dropped them down to 10th position in the end. So into oh, the uh, La Source hairpin they go. And uh, it is looking good right now, you'd have to say, for Bradley Ellis and Ollie Wilkinson. They are 11th 
excuse me, 0.3 seconds clear of McLeod now second, Geddy third, still with Rob Bell on his tail, and they're still fighting for a podium position, so this is worth uh, keeping an eye on this little scrap. In GT4, by the way, oh, look at that. Uh, it is the number four car of Smith still ahead of Canning, and this is situation normal, really. They've been nose to tail for the best part of an hour now, and Canning hasn't found a way through. You have to suggest, therefore, he's not likely to in the last lap and a half, is he? No, he's closed back up. There was a bit of a gap right at one point in our two seconds. He's now obviously back down to tenths of a second. So he's still got the pace. He just doesn't seem to have the sort of the key to unlock the answer of Smith's uh, defensive slash perfect driving so far. Not one mistake in an hour under that much pressure is hugely, hugely impressive from uh, from young Josh Smith. So they get one more lap, even though the uh, the time will run out because the GT3 leader has started the last lap. They will also do the same so they've got one more lap one more opportunity oh. for canning all the way around the outside oh. and so oh has that damaged the mclaren i think it has has it the smoke out of the back yeah uh, i mean it, it, there's a, a radiator in the door basically where it is canning's got the position yeah it's done the ltr uh so no the uh, the other radiator on the mclaren so he, he could be able to finish the lap uh, i don't know man that's bad, isn't it? It's spilling out onto the rear tyre as well. He's about to head into Eau Rouge with that, where you really lean on that left rear tyre. Uh, He's pulling off. Oh, I don't believe the heartbreak for the number four squad, who have just had uh, the unluckiest season, I think, in motor racing history. This is just insane. Nothing has gone right for them. And having led with just over a lap to go, they pull off with damage after contact with the Aston Martin. Well, we'll dissect that in a moment or two. There'll be plenty to dissect after this race. Right now, though, let's focus on the Optimum Motorsport squad who are about to become the sixth different winner from seven races this year. They're about to take their first victory, therefore, of the season as well. And this will be Bradley Ellis's first British GT win in 11 years. 2008 at Snetterton was his last victory. Whoa. Oh, uh, and there's fluid, I think, maybe down from that McLaren. But Bradley Ellis, with one last little heart-stopping moment, comes through and wins round number seven of the British GT Championship with Ollie Wilkinson delighted with that. And Rob Bell spins! Rob Bell spins from fourth position. There's definitely fluid down at the bus stop chicane from the Tolman McLaren. And Rob Bell, well, he, I don't think he'd got past Geddy, so it hasn't cost him a place. But my word, the 58 McLaren seems to be stopping now as well at the finish. It is all going wrong here for McLaren at the end of the race. McLeod comes home second, ten and a half seconds off the leader. Glingetti comes home in third with Ryan Ratcliffe back on the podium. There's more cars going off. That's uh, Andy Prio having a moment. One of the GT4 Astons is off. Oh, everyone's going off on this fluid at the last corner. And we could There's have a Nikki change of position team. here. Nicky Team, Adam Christodoulou. No, Christodoulou sliding around. Can't get the power down. Coming out of the corner. What an end to what has been a balmy race anyway. But that was a particularly balmy end to the race. And in GT4, it is going to be, and I add the word controversially here, and also provisionally, the victory that will go to the 97 Aston Martin, uh, which is being driven in this final stint by Tom Canning. It was started by Ash Hand. They've run in the top four all day long. They've had a good race. It's a shame, though, isn't it, that it ended that way with the contact with the McLaren, uh, but they are going to come home victorious, and uh, I'm sure there will be a discussion post-race about that, but it's going to be a good day for Aston Martin as Optimum win in GT4, in GT3, and TF Sport take their first victory of the season in the GT4 category as well, after what at times has been a trying season with the 97 car, which is still in championship contention, remember, wins in GT4 here at the Spa-Francorchamps circuit, uh, and actually by a fairly sizable margin over, it'll be Lewis Proctor, won't it, now in the five car, who is slow? I think he's probably been warned of the fluid somewhere uh, in the yes. last corner and he's just driving off the line. He's got plenty of yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, those boys have done well. I think, I mean, I'm biased. Listen, I work for McLaren. I'm about as unbiased as a <laughs> North Korea TV station as we see Ollie Wilkinson uh, celebrate. And uh, while we're looking at it, Bradley Ellis, what a job. Ollie yeah. Wilkinson started racing three years ago. Bradley's been his coach since day one. He's taken this kid from Leeds and absolutely transformed into a British GT winner. That is a, a long process and the hours that Brad and Ollie have put into that is well deserved. And like I was saying, I, I'm, I'm biased, but I actually think the move was okay by Canning. Right. I think he'd gone around the outside and he was there. I think Smith was either unaway he was there or was 
keen to make sure that Canning couldn't get past him and tried to close the door. Uh, uh, we've only seen it once. We need to see another replay. But my gut instinct is how we see it on the track is how it finishes as we see the Jag loser on the fluid. This isn't come some kind of style point finish that they're going for. <laughs> he puts all the smoke down. Bradley Ellis probably has a little moment out of his mouth and his other end and uh, then just brings it to the line for the win, which is great. We then see Rob Bell later on after McLeod obviously finds it okay. Malvin runs wide. And then, uh, yeah, all chaos ensues. And it, it's just the cooling. It's not just water. There's all the chemicals in it. And it's like a, a, a slippery f film, basically. So, yeah, you go from 100% grip to kind of 5%. And it looks like the McLaren's got a rear left puncture, the HHC one. Mm. So it's not too happy on the rear left. Um, so that was fortunate time. And it's just outside its garage as well. So it should get home uh, <laughs> on a good speed as well. So, yeah, that was a great race. And then suddenly the last five <laughs> minutes went mental and I didn't have a chance to breathe. That was incredible, wasn't it? I mean, the British GC Championship continues to go from strength to strength, and we use that phrase a lot, but my word, it does. I mean, look at the action we've had in the last two hours. I can't even, I'm, I'm not looking forward to having to remind you of all the highlights in a few minutes' time because I won't remember them all, I guarantee. There was just so much going on, and some of the best racing we've seen in a long time. And yes, there was a bit of contact on a few occasions, but we've got a big grid, we've got two classes, we've got differing speeds of drivers out there, and they're fighting tooth and nail now because one, you know, if you spend a couple of laps stuck behind someone, you can lose maybe a couple of seconds that you will not gain back because everyone is so evenly matched. You have to go for these moves and it does produce lots of spectacular action. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed the two hours of racing here. I think that man has. <laughs> that is uh, Ollie Wilkinson then wandering down the pit lane in disbelief, I think. Uh, and <laughs> the fact that he's won a race. And that's the first time this year that a silver-silver driver combo has won in GT3. In GT4, almost every car is a silver silver, but in GT3, there are only the two, and they are both on the podium because Glingetti and Ryan Ratcliffe end up third as well. There he is, there is uh, Bradley Ellis. It's taken you 11 years to do it again, but what a place to do it and what a way to do it. Yeah, no, thanks for the highlights. It's been 11 years since uh, <laughs> I won a, a GT3 race outright, so uh, no, but must have been your little chat before the start, so well, I couldn't have done I'll, it take, I'll take some credit yeah, as well. No, should, we, should we bring Ollie in as no, well? Definitely, this is boys. What a what a result this has Ollie. been. What a place to win and, and what a way to do it. No, you know, this is the one of the feature races of the season. You know, everyone loves coming to Spa and then to put it on pole, lies the flag, you know, in the lead. Couldn't have done it with, uh, without Ollie, really. He's just been a mega, mega, mega driver to, to partner with. Ollie, you had a nail biting uh, 59 or so minutes of, of watching. How's that been for you? Yeah, absolutely amazing to come here to Spa this weekend for the British GT and take a pole position in a class win. I'm absolutely over the moon with that. I'm sensing we're going to see a proper celebration dance up on the top step, aren't we? I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to, I'll try my best. Yeah. Well done, boys. Go and enjoy Thank it. You Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Nice one. Oh. Well, enjoy it, they will, just as we enjoyed the last 120 minutes of racing action. And yeah, to, to my point, it is the first silver-silver driver combo that I've won in GT3. And that goes to show just how pro those pro drivers are, because they are very, very hard to beat, despite the fact uh, that uh, the silver cars, of course, are numbered with an AM driver, but they still are able to uh, occasionally <laughs> compete for race victories well what a race that was I think we're all slightly in shock really at uh, everything that was going on there and we will confirm the result for you in a moment or two but it was Bradley Ellis and Ollie Wilkinson then who took the victory from pole position that makes it sound a lot easier than it probably was they did lead almost every lap as well but only won by ten and a half seconds in the end uh, over in second place Ian Loggie and Callum McLeod and third for Ryan Ratcliffe and Glyn Getty three different makes in the top three in fact, there are four different makes in the top four because Rob Bell and Sean Balfe survived that last corner spin to finish in fourth position. Nicky Team and Mark Farmer were fifth. Richard Neary and Adam Christodoulou were sixth, ahead of Johnny Cocker and Sam Dehan, seventh. And they, by my reckoning, will move just about into the points lead. In GT4, by the way, Tom Canning was able to come home, as we said, to win the race in the 97 car that he shares with Ash Hand. Second place went the way of Lewis Proctor uh, in the number five car with Jordan Collard. Third for number 95, that was uh, Josh Price and Patrick Kibble. They started second as well, so a good day for uh, TF Sport all round, really, in GT4 at least. Michael O'Brien in the number 20 car that he shared with Graham Johnson came from 18th on the grid to finish fourth. That was a good drive, and uh, rounding out the top five in GT4 was the 75, uh, Aston Martin, the Optimum Motorsport car, Patrick Matisson and Mike Robinson. Combination of the full result there as well. A couple of notable ones to mention. Uh, we were focusing a lot on the 19 Multimatic Motorsports Ford Mustang. That finished in 19th place overall, which was the fifth highest 
GT4 car. Yes, fifth in GT4. So good day there for Sir Chris Hoy and um, Andy Prio. Uh, sorry, that's the 15 car, excuse me, was fifth. The 19 car uh, was uh, sixth place in Pro-Am, excuse me. They were 27th overall. But yes, so the 15 uh, Multimatic Mustang will therefore, I think, maintain its championship advantage just about, but it won't be by a huge margin. Now, it will have come down ever so slightly, but not necessarily to those that were breathing down its neck points-wise uh, coming in to the weekend. So uh, things will no doubt have chopped and changed in the points. The big winners, I suppose, are Tolman Motorsports, Jordan Collard and Lewis Proctor. So they take home the maximum 37 and a half points, which puts them just over 100 points. Maxwell and Prio for fifth place will score 15. So there's maybe going to be three or four points in it now in GT4 as well between the Mustang and the Tolman McLaren, but a day to forget for HHC with both of their cars in the end running into problems late on. Fabulous two hours of racing though, the drivers are slowly making their way up to the podium and in baking hot conditions now here at spa Francorchamps, the uh, race completed and what a race it was and Joe Osborne that was I think possibly the race of the year that was certainly uh, there was never a dull moment was there over the two hours which often is the case but uh, this one in particular when you, when you add in especially some of the championship implications and all of our championship contenders it seemed hitting trouble at one point or another that was a dramatic couple of hours. Yeah, it definitely was. And it wasn't any major contact, no safety cars. So it was a good level of racing cleanness wise. There's a few little things, but when you see three cars going into Eau Rouge, obviously Getty, one of them, McLeod, the other, and uh, Rob Bell being the other, and all three getting through. I think that is a highlight for me that I've, I've seen at Spa and GT racing. So great job for all the guys. And I think it's a deserved podium as well. I don't think anyone there has got lucky. Everyone has done it and the winners haven't put a foot wrong and that's what it should all be about. You have a clean race and you do everything right, you should win. And that's what's happened to uh, Ollie and Brad there. We often say that in long distance racing, and I count a two hour race as a, a reasonably uh, long race. Um, the uh, two hour race is, uh, you know, we often say that qualifying doesn't really count for a huge amount, but they started on pole, did Optimum, and uh, they were able to pull away and, and make the most of that trap position they had from the start. Yeah, good to see Sam Tang get driver of the day, gentleman wise, uh, yeah. which is great. I, I thought he, he deserved it, so it's good that. SRO also just uh, do it. We've got Eva Hel Hildebrand, sorry, from S uh, Sunoco uh, handing out the trophies. Boys will get their hands on the lovely, lovely sweet champagne before they spray each other. And uh, it's quite nice on a day like this to cool yourself down. A little bit sticky, but at least it uh, it tastes so nice. Uh, yes, indeed. And they will enjoy a bottle or two, I'm sure, later on this afternoon as well. But, uh, but yeah, they, uh, they started from pole. They led virtually every lap. There may have been a couple in the middle that they didn't because of the... Um, pit stop sequences, etc. Uh, but uh, they led, uh, Bradley Edison, Ollie Wilkins, Wilkins between them led 46 laps. Only the number seven car led another three laps. And that was as a result of them pitting a little bit later. So uh, they really were dominant today. And yet still it was in question down until the last 10 minutes as to whether they would hang on. And uh, they do now spray the champagne, not only on each other, but on the eager crowd down below who have assembled to celebrate with them. And that is then your GT3 overall podium presentation made to Bradley Ellis and Ollie Wilkinson, your race winners, Callum McLeod and Ian Loggie in second, and Glyn Geddy and Ryan Ratcliffe, who get on to the podium for the second time this year. So they vacate the podium then. Ollie's still got a bit of work to do there. He'd already sprayed all his champagne by the time he went to get the crowd. So he's young, he's still got to learn. But uh, yeah, it's good to see everyone loving it so much. And I think two-hour race there's so much pent up like he's just in a constant state of fear as a driver when you're not in the car of what's going to happen so when you finally get to the end and you get on the podium then there's uh, yeah, a lot of pent-up frustration yeah, absolutely and, and, and we saw at the end of the race as well that it would have been very easy for uh, Bradley Ellis to have switched off and sort of thought well I've got a comfortable margin now it's the last corner and then all of a sudden it's a good job he wasn't switched off because things can happen right at the end of the race and it's no wonder that the teams and drivers down in the pit lane are chewing their fingernails until the car has crossed that check of that start finish line and seen the check of flag and then maybe they can just start to relax. 
Well, uh, TF Sport were due a good race. I think we said that a couple of hours ago, and they certainly had a good one in GT4. Their GT3 challenge faded slightly as far as the 47 car was concerned, but uh, Nicky Team got their GT3 car into fifth, and then they're both of their GT4 cars on the podium. Tom Ferry will be a happy man, I think, this evening. A circuit maybe that suits the Aston Martins, or is this just the fact that the team are now getting on top of these cars that were new, both the GT3 and GT4 car was new this season? Yeah, I think the latter. I think uh, the BOP is okay. I don't think it's amazing. I think it's TF are really, really getting on top of this car now in, in GT4 and GT3, and they're giving the uh, drivers the opportunity to go and win races like they have in GT4 and do the fastest lap like they did in GT3 with Nicky Team. So a bit more luck on the AM side in GT3. They could have had two cars on the podium there as well, I think. Well, Nicky Team gained about 30-odd seconds on the race leader during his stint as well. He finished just 40 seconds off the lead and he was well over a minute back when he uh, took over from Mark Farmer. So the uh, champagne celebrations then amongst the GT4 drivers is uh, done. And uh, very young podium that is as well, isn't it? Which I... Uh, uh, if they're underage. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe they have to spray it rather than drink it. But uh, I think Ash Hand is probably the oldest driver up there and he's not exactly... Um, An old uh, hand. And exactly. <laughs> exactly. I see what you did there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, there is a lot of youth these days in GT racing. And I think that's something that's changed a bit over... Maybe this is with the success of the GT3 and GT4 categories over the last decade or so. But young up-and-coming drivers really now see GTs as not only a place that they can progress their career, but they can make a living out of it as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, single-seaters at the moment. We see the state it's in, Formula 1. There's only really 12 drivers getting paid, and they're few and far between across other championships. Whereas GT, there's... there's probably 150 guys in the world getting paid to do it so it's a, a lot more plausible to make a career of it as you said and uh, yeah we see the the pro-am nature of gt racing scott will get paid from nick mikey o'brien will get paid from graham johnson matt george will be getting paid as well so it's a great way to to earn a living driving cars around in circles is a, is a very uh, fortunate way to have your career go uh, there are worse jobs in the world aren't there that's for sure but so uh, yeah the, that's another pro-am podium then for the jaguar they're racking them up a little bit at the moment that is their it's their, it's only their second of the year, actually. I know it's their third of the year, excuse me. They have had three podiums in Pro-Am this year, have the Jaguar. That's a really good result for the Balf GT4 guys, Graham Johnson there. He's had a, a prominent weekend. His race boots are too small, he told me. Uh, but they, they cost too much money. They're a £1,000, so he doesn't want to change them. He told his wife they're already 500 as well. So great job by those guys. And uh, again, three different cars on the podium there. McLaren. Jaguar and a Mercedes, so uh, yeah, I wonder, uh, it'd be interesting to know what Plowman's take on that was, uh, obviously finishing behind that Mercedes after the bit of contact with Malvin and uh, him clash at Le Con. Uh, yeah, indeed. Now, speaking of Martin Plowman, they finished fourth in class, so they will score 18 points, which is nine fewer than Michael O'Brien and Graham Johnson, so that gap comes down to just 11 points now at the top of the GT4 Pro-Am championship campaign as well, so... Uh, uh, if you are with us at Donington, Joe, and I hope you are, then I think we're going to be in for a really, really intense end to the season. We've got two races to go now as well, and two completely different circuits, Brands Hatch and Donington Park Grand Prix. So whatever car you're in, one of those racetracks will suit you. It's going down to the wire, this isn't it? Not just in GT3 and GT4, but within the Pro-Am elements as well. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I... I'm a betting man. I actually wouldn't put on money on any of them at the moment because it is too close to call. Too many variables. We haven't really had a consistent pairing yet to every round go out and knock out the ballpark and, and do the job that's needed. There's been a few mistakes, be it on the team front or drivers, so it's been really, really difficult. Uh, so, yeah, hard to hard to go with that. I think Andy uh, Andy Jay's in the pit lane with the GT4 winner, so it'd be good to get their take on uh, how their two hours went. First up, you got absolutely caked in champagne there. I mean, that's part and parcel of winning, isn't it? Yeah, part and parcel of winning, but your teammate's drowning you in it. That invests, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'll forgive him. What a stint. How does it feel to, to win here at Spa? I'm over the moon. Uh, Spa, what a place to do it as well. Uh, I think Ash did a big chunk of the work in the first stint, going from sixth to second. So for me, it was just a job of finishing it off. But yeah, Ash. Ash did a big chunk of the work, but just over the moon to win here. And for Aston Martin, uh, for the Aston Martin Vantage, it's his first win in British GT this year. So it's brilliant for them, TF Sport and us. So. Is that the best you've driven us? Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, I, think it's, I think it's consistency of what we've done throughout the year. We've gone from Alton Park, where we had two DNFs, 
we had an awful weekend to start with and we decided that we were going to build up throughout the year and we were going to aim to try and lead the championship and get to there before the last round so hopefully at the next round if we can lead the championship there and then we gain good points but I think the driving from both of us has been consistent like Tom all weekend he's been topping the, um, the table in terms of free practice free practice too we've been right up there in pace the whole time so when you go into a race like this you feel so prepared it's easy to drive in a confident way and feel like you're going to win because all the preparation we've done together to help each other is, is so strong. So I'm over the moon with the result. I couldn't be happier. I and mean, to have a winner's trophy in our hand at Spa is, is meaningful, yeah. Fellas, you just won at Spa. Give it some. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you. Happy days. Well done. Cheers, Brilliant. Thanks. Good stuff. Uh, that only leaves me to well, throw back to our fabulous commentary team, Joe and Andy. Talk us through this incredible race, would you? Oh, we'll do our best. There was quite a lot going on, though, over two hours. And it all started with Optima Motorsport at the front. And it finished with Optima Motorsport at the front. Easy as that. There was a lot that happened in between, though. At the start, it was very, very congested with a late call to change the lights uh, to uh, from red to green. And the race got underway with the 96 car leading them into the first quarter. It was a good start made by Michael Igo as well in the number 18 McLaren. Uh, Lamborghini, excuse me, whilst a few others tried some weird and wacky lines through the first quarter to gain ground. There was contact, though, between Rick Parfit and Sam Dehan. Sam Dehan, second in the championship, ended up pointing the wrong way, and it looked as though their day was going to end in disaster. Mark Farmer was also in trouble as he tried to make a move around the outside of Richard Neary. He got tagged into a spin, and he became one of many drivers trying to fight back after early problems. Calvin Fletcher had a good stint, though. He was racing well in the GT4 beach dean aston martin and then there was a spin for adam ballon the championship leading lamborghini into the fence coming out of the fastest corner on the track front and rear damage their day was done and they have lost their championship lead now to the sister car it was all getting very physical out there amongst most of the battles in gt3 and gt4 before the pit stop window opened and the optimum car came into the pit lane to serve its uh, penaltyless pit stop from which it was able to rejoin still as the race leader as the GT3 cars battled amongst the GT4s, things got very close. And then we had a phenomenal three-wide move for second place into Eau Rouge, which saw Callum McLeod move from fourth to second, a position he would hold to the flag. There was late drama, though, for the Tolman McLaren nerfed out of the lead of GT4. But Optima Motorsports, Ollie Wilkinson and Bradley Ellis won the GT3 category after a phenomenal two hours of racing here at Spa-Francorchamps.